Are you ready to turn your cricket knowledge into cash? Introducing Gully Cricket, the ultimate fantasy cricket app in the UK, USA and Canada. Dive into the world of Gully Cricket where your cricket expertise earns you real money. Create your own team and compete with your friends and other fans. With daily contests, big cash prizes and a user-friendly interface, Gully Cricket is your ticket to the excitement of fantasy cricket. Win cash at every catch, wicket, dot ball or run. Download Gully Cricket now from the App Store or Google Play. Sign up now and claim up to £500 in deposit bonus. Join the league, showcase your skills and win big. Hello and welcome to a truly monstrous episode of the Wiz and Cricket Weekly <laughs> podcast. We have got so much lined up for you. We'll chat about the career trajectories of Alex Hales and Jason Roy, who will miss chunks of the English White Bull summer for different reasons. There's a brilliant interview that Ben's done with Kent duo Daniel Bell Drummond and Tawanda Muyeye, who is one of the most exciting young batting talents in the country with a fascinating backstory. We chat about the 100 draft, the IPL that starts tomorrow, the Winindu Hasaranga situation, which is potentially my all time favourite cricket story. There's the WPL and PSL finals, and there's also some chat around how to get more kids into the county championship. I'm Yazrana, and with me today are Phil Walker. And ESPN Quick Info's Matt Roller, Mark Butcher, will be joining us later in the show. Matt, good to have you on. Um, Phil, the magazine's in the can. Did you notice that? <laughs> <laughs> Lovely to have you on. Yeah, yeah, the, the magazine's done. Uh, latish, latish last night. Uh, yeah, obviously, I'm, I'm mildly proud of it. I think mm. it's good. It's, it's an interesting front cover that got the thumbs up from you. Mm -hmm. That gets released early next week um yeah obviously the, the great joe Harmon, the ineffable joe Harmon, is is uh, very much in ireland these days and so and so we communicate across the waves uh and put in a magazine together slightly more fiddly um mm. uh but no uh, we, we got it we got it done nicely i think um mm. i'm looking forward to it coming out uh, uh, we'll talk about it probably next week but um there's a really good interview with sean masood in it who Undoubtedly has the toughest and maddest job in cricket, doesn't he? Captain not just of Pakistan, <laughs> but Yorkshire as well. What an effort that is. Mel Farrell's done a, done a real screamer on that one. But anyway, more of that awesome. next week. Um, so our trivia question to kick things off this week. Remember that the answer will be revealed at the end of the show. Uh, so Phil and Matt have an hour or so to have a think about it. Um, the question is, who was the first English player to take a wicket or score a run in the IPL? Who was the first English player? to take a wicket or score a run in the IPL. Do not say the answer if you know it. We'll save it for the very end. Um, Do you know? I think so, but I'm... We'll, we'll find out in, a, in an hour or so. <laughs> um, by the way, today, the English season has, has, has technically started today. So Hampshire and Middlesex are playing each other in a pre-season friendly in England. Yeah, and I, I looked up today. Today, we are, we are a day closer to the winter um, equinox than we are to the summer solstice as well. Um, too early to be playing cricket. How many uh, beanies have we seen at the pre-season friendly? Uh, I've not checked, but I'm sure there are quite a few. Um, it kicks off actually today, right? There, there's yeah, some pre seasons yeah. today, yeah. The performative Superb. beanie in March 21st. It's mm. going to be. Even, it's actually pretty warm at the moment. But That's true. That's true. Let's kick off with 100 draft. So the headline news was that none of the eight teams fancied Jason Roy. Um, Matt, given the auction dynamics, it's not actually that much of a surprise that Roy didn't get picked up. Yeah, not hugely, um, although it's obviously quite a, uh, a sort of sliding doors moment in his career, I, I suppose, given that, um, you know, we know he's likely to miss about half of the, the T20 blast already uh, with Surrey because of his commitments in Major League Cricket. Um, and it feels like having been such a key part of two England teams in, in the one day side and the T20 side for, um, what, five years or even more than that, um, he is now sort of... Not quite a pariah, but is a he's going to be a peripheral figure at best in this English summer, where mm. he's going to play a handful of games um, and be the guy that people remember rather than the guy that mm. people are coming to see. Um, and yeah, it is it is even even though um, he he put himself in with a reserve price of a hundred thousand pounds and and clearly hasn't done very well in the hundred. I think he's averaged thirteen over the last two years, which speaks for itself. Um, it, it is still quite a, a big deal that someone who, mm. who won a World Cup with England four and a half years ago now um, isn't isn't getting a gig in the, the Premier White Ball competition. Um, mm. Clearly, teams prioritise overseas players with their top picks this year. I think Tom Kohler Cadmore was the only um, English guy picked at the draft in the in the top bracket. Um, 
but yeah, it is still still quite a big deal that Jason Roy isn't getting picked. Um, I think quite a few quite a few people would have would have seen the results of that draft, and that would have been the thing that they were surprised by more than anything else. Mm. And it looks like, you know, some players were maybe a bit savvier with their reserve prices. Dal Milan, who was in the England T20 side more recently than Jason Roy, had half the reserve price. Yeah. Um, and he he was picked up. Um, Phil, e- even if it's unsurprising given the, the context of, of the draft and Roy's reserve price, that is still um, a massive fall for, for Roy, who was only playing for England just over a year ago. He last played for England. He was involved in the T20 side less than two years ago. And, he, and he's only 33 as well, you know, this is someone who, re- who really ought to be still like really in and amongst what's what's happening in English white ball cricket. And so can we conclude then that his his time with England is done? I, th- I think he's played his last international. And I it's think. hard to see how he gets back into it with this latest situation. Absolutely. I yeah. think as soon as he as soon as he had that final back spasm before the World Cup, which effectively rendered him unselectable, given um, England couldn't be confident that he was going to be fit enough to get through a world cup um i think that was probably him done at that point yeah. in international cricket which it, you know is such as he has said it's, it's almost surprising looking at it and thinking god this guy's only 33 mm. he, he there's there's definitely another reality in which you know his career's gone a little bit differently in the last four years and he's still front and center he was still opening the batting at that mm. world cup but i mean he's the um, same age as best though right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And, and you know it, yeah it's, it's I, I was looking for some blue tack earlier to put some <laughs> some pictures up on the wall and uh, in the bottom drawer, just behind you, Matt, there is a lo- load of old magazine covers that we put in frames. Mm. And the first one on top of the pile is Jason Roy from issue four of WCM, which would have been 2018, early 2018, just after he did that mad 180 <laughs> at Melbourne. Do um, you remember that in the, in the yeah, 50 yeah. over game? Yeah. Uh, and the front cover is his, it's an interview with him and him saying, I'm, I'm ready for test cricket. Uh, turned out he was never ready for test cricket. But that's where the Roy story was at one point. Not only was he this outlier at the top of the order in 50 and 20 and obviously ended up becoming a World Cup winner two years after that article, but there was a lot of serious talk about him in playing test cricket and, and, and turned up and played some Ashes test cricket as well. Arguably, possibly jettisoned a bit quicker than... than than you might have expected considering that other pe- other players got certain chances and came back and so on and so on. But he's a slightly enigmatic player, really, Jason Roy. How how will he be? And it's hard to start talking in the past tense about players. I always feel that's a bit... Mm. It's not, not like they've died, right? Mm. It's just that he hasn't played for England in the last year. But how will he be remembered? I guess as as a player who, in that early instance, that 2015 time where everything was open and everything was possible in this best of all possible worlds that he became the kind of the the poster boy for it, right? Because there was attacking players, there were players who played on the front foot, and then there was him. Mm. There was something else entirely. Famously applauded for smashing one straight to point in the first <laughs> ball of the Morgan era, the, the, yeah. the post-World Cup Morgan era. Uh, nonetheless, the, the fall-off in the last couple of years has been quite pronounced. And I remember actually the three of us talking about this at, when we did a show over there in the other part of the Oval. And... Mm. I sort of pulled a half-baked theory out, out of my ass, believe it or not, that the relentlessness of playing 20-over cricket brings about a, perhaps a kind of sort of psychological weariness, you know, and, and, and the lack of, of diversity within your, your requirements as a, as a cricketer. Go out there and if you face 30 balls, your day's done. You, you're done well because you'll be 60 not out. And then you get in a car or a bus and then you go somewhere else and do the same thing. And perhaps he's he's had a wonderful time of it in the last couple of years. Certainly his bank balance will be fine. But is there enough real professional satisfaction? And does that then become problematic to keep going to the well all the time, right? You know, mm. he wanted to play test cricket. He had grand ambitions for himself. And in the last two or three years, it's been a sort of slow descent, hasn't it, really? Mm. You know, it, it, there's been questions around his position in the in the England side, and then he'll come back and he played well. He, he played well in the West Indies in this a year or so ago, and here and there. But the sense of diminishing returns was hard to avoid with him, and mm. and I wonder if it's in part because of the the pigeonholed job that he's had to he's had to have uh, that maybe just 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 gets tired of it. You know, get tired of doing the same old thing, 
day after day after day after day. And actually, at the moment, two of the players that England could do with having a good IPL when we come on to that have probably arguably suffered from a very similar thing in Liam Livingston and Sam Curran, who have played probably more T20 cricket than pretty much anyone in the world, or at least they're right up there in terms of appearances in the last 12, 18 months. And in both those cases, I think you could make quite a good case that they could use the opportunity to actually, you know, bat and bowl and repeat the skill for a, a prolonged period of time in a way they don't mm-hmm. really get the opportunity to anymore. I think yeah. just, just before the World Cup, Livingston had a couple of innings uh, against New Zealand in that sort of strange uh, precursor yeah. series, tune-up series, where he was facing 50, 60, 70 balls and actually batted really well. But after that, we're saying, you know, he was pretty pretty knackered. It was the first time he'd done it in however long. Mm. Um, so I do think there's something in that. Phil, Phil Soul, we talked about this briefly last week. Ben, ben interviewed Phil Soul a week and a half ago. And this was before he got an IPL call up. But he was talking up his involvement in the championship. Now, there might have been a Bob each way element to it, right? But he was talking up his involvement in the championship, anticipating the joys of being able just to play, play across an afternoon and learn little bits more about your game, about elements that perhaps you weren't necessarily aware of. You know, you, you overcome difficult periods in white in red ball cricket that perhaps you haven't had to confront in years because of you, you get shifted and shunted into a particular identity in the game. Um, perhaps there's an element that Roy has struggled with that as well himself. I don't know. It, mm. It's obviously wild speculation, but, Whatever happens with him from now, he will always be the, be the man who, who who helped carry England to that that 2019 yeah. World Cup, and he will always have that over in the in the semi final against Australia, where where he hit three in a row. Yeah, I mean, Matt, we were before we were recording, we were talking about the Ben White situation in football, and part. Oh, of you two go on about this a lot. And, of the time. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and part of that, you dis- got a ticket for the quarterfinal. <laughs> <laughs> and part of that discussion is that if you're a squad player for a national team at a major tournament and you know you're not going to play it's not a particularly fun experience but some players have reputations for being very good in, around the dressing room and actually sort of thrive in those environments and I sort of feel the same with fran- the franchise circuit if you're playing T20 cricket only around the world in these weird leagues sometimes some players might be fine with it but th- not everyone is going to be. That's, that's a difficult lifestyle for everyone to, to sort of get behind. Absolutely. And I think Roy is in quite an interesting situation, actually, because much as, you know, he's clearly fallen off a bit in the past few years and isn't the player he once was, there is also the, the argument that, you know, he would be playing in the IPL this year if he wanted to be because mm. he pulled out of a contract a couple of weeks ago because of the fact he was so exhausted after having so many gigs mm. over the winter. So, um, you know... It, much as he's clearly fading from from prominence within English cricket from a from a global point of view, you know, there's every chance he's going to keep playing around the world for the various Knight Riders teams and keep earning a decent living for a long time. And, mm. uh, you know, it, I remember about this time last year, he hit some absolutely mad hundred in the Pakistan yeah. Super League. And he he is still clearly capable of doing that mm. every now and then, maybe less than he once was. But um, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting position he's in where clearly um, he is still going to get loads of offers for the next however long and, and players who are his age, um, you know, he, he could he could do another three, four, five years on the franchise circuit, then retire and then, you know, get, get himself on the legend circuit, which seems to be the latest thing going <laughs> yeah. around where there's big, big money being thrown about. So um I, I you know i don't think he's going to struggle for cash anytime soon but yeah. fulfillment might be a, a different question who knows and the other thing it, it, it reinforces is just how quickly the churn happens now in in modern cricket you know there are so many obviously roy was and is a special talent uh but there are many other imitators of that kind of role now mm. and you can pick out a couple of really good options at basically any county and that's only just talking about english cricket you know we have 400 plus professional male cricketers most of whom are leaning towards the white ball if they're good enough and many of who many of that number have all the shots in the book now they might not have the crispness of of shot that roy had in his pomp i'm not Mm. saying that it's a kind of it's an easy gig but it's a clearly defined gig and a lot of players now are trying to basically imitate that 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 role and and when we were putting a team together for the magazine you know looking forward to the upcoming season it struck me that there's a lot of players young english male cricketers who are quite identical players you know that they are multi multi format initially but with a particular power in the white ball game mm-hmm. but they can field often they can kind of keep a little bit as well they are very much multi-faceted modern cricketers now mm. 
And if you have a, a, an iffy year or two, especially with the 100 now adding another element of jeopardy to it, if you have an iffy year or two, then you're yesterday's man in a way that it wouldn't have been the case in previous years. On, on how he will and should be remembered as, a, as an international player, um, in, in, funny you mentioned the, the test stuff. I think it's, it's as a 50 over player, not a T20 player. Um, and actually, while there are lots of T20 openers who, who bat like Roy does, um, very, very few players in the history of ODI cricket have managed to pull off what he was able to do at his peak. And he didn't. He wasn't at the 2023 World Cup, but it was a good World Cup for his legacy, I thought, because <laughs> such a big part of the World Cup win in 2019 was just how good Roy and Besto were. And uh, Besto wasn't in that form in 2023 and Roy wasn't there. Um, and, you know, you, you'll know more than anyone, you know, that the noise is out of the England camp. Part of the reason why they wanted Roy so much, even though the numbers weren't saying that he was in your best 11 players, was because of how good he was four, four years prior to that. Yeah, and, and there was a reason why they gave him such a such a long rope. Yeah. And, um, you know, he, he I think he played more ODIs than anyone else in, the, in that cycle between World Cups. And, um, you know, he, he was probably one of the few guys that almost was given so much rope that yeah. he did end up hanging himself. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I agree. I think he'll, he'll always be, particularly with the, the iconic moment of, Having misfielded already in the super mm. over, executing the run out at the end, I think that that will be that will be his his main mm. the association him and the light blue kit at Lords. Yeah, um, some other big names uh, that weren't picked up in the auction draft, rather. Um, Mark Wood, David Warner, Bavrazam. I guess Wood uh, hasn't really played in the hundred, and you imagine that England will be carefully managing his workload, so not as big a story there. Um, loads of West Indies players picked, Matt. Um, and this is not an accident. The ECB have actually done a pretty good job in ensuring some big name availability, which has been missing at times in recent years. Yeah, there was a, a rare example of um, boards and competitions speaking to each other and uh, acting in collective best interests rather than self interests. Um, mm. In that, uh, yeah, the ECB had some talks with the Caribbean Premier League at some point, I think at the start of this year or maybe end of last year, um, and made sure that the windows didn't overlap. Um, which means that, uh, yeah, you can get to a situation where I think five of the seven 125 grand picks at the men's draft last night were mm. West Indies guys um, and all power hitters, basically. Um, and yeah, it's a, a rare win for uh, for common sense in, in scheduling. Um, there is obviously a slight overlap between the 100 and Major League Cricket, which a few of those guys might miss a game or two because of. Um, but it's not quite as bad as I think was originally feared. I think mm. the 100 starts on the 23rd of July and I think the Major League final is going to be the 28th. Um, so it it shouldn't be many games. Whereas I think the original fear was that that could eat into two weeks of the 100, pay more money and be mm. a real um, you know, an, an example as to why the 100 so desperately supposedly needs private investment um, so that it can increase the salaries and be more competitive. But I think the 100 will be a really intriguing situation this year because of the fact that there's so much talk about its future um, and it's kind of assumed that it will be opened up to private investment and in time new teams the following year. It almost feels like a holding mm. year. Um, it's going up against the Olympics. But then again, this is also, this was the sort of summer that, form the logic from ECB's point of view as to why they wanted to have a domestic cricket property that they could sell and make front and centre because Sri Lanka and West Indies mm. are not the most um, high profile men's test tourists. So it'll be yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it goes. I thought it was I thought it had its its best year so far last year after a pretty mediocre second season in particular. Mm. Um but yeah, I, I, it looks like the names are generally pretty good this year, I would say. Probably yeah. the best set of overseas players so far. But I'm just, just going to read them off because I, th I think it is the best year on, on paper. So Nassim Shah, Russell, Hetmeyer, Puran, Pollard, Robin Powell, Shaheen, and in the women's competition, Risha Ghosh, Meg Lanning, Mooney, Molyneux, Sutherland, Atapatu, Mandana, Ash Gardner. Um, a lot of the big name Aussie players in the women's competition didn't actually play last year. So... Um, I think both competitions, on paper at least, at this stage, and obviously there are always withdrawals with these sorts of competitions. So the the, the list of names now might look quite different. And, um, and Aussie male time. players? Um, there aren't many. Yeah, no, not so many. None, none in that list that you read out. Yeah. You're talking sort of Dan Sam's um, category of, of Australians, I think, because of the fact that... Because they, are, they essentially rest because the money is not quite good enough, right? I, well, and I think also because there's two major league teams that are associated to states in Australia, that is a more a, oh. attractive link for them. 
I see. Um, so so I Ma- think Maxwell, them, Tim David et al, they will be playing in America. Yeah, quite possibly. I think Steve Smith is going to play Major League post the T20 World Cup is the, is the thinking for the mighty Washington Interesting. Freedom. Interesting. Um, well, mm. I don't care, provided Rothman, my, my boy Rothman's in. So who's mm. he playing for? Who's, Trent Rockets. He's, he's at the Rockets. With, with tiny he? boundaries. Yeah. What Rothman Powell at Trent Bridge could be yeah. something. And in that little yellow shirt as well. He's going <laughs> to be bursting out of it. Anyway, big, um, big fan of, of Rothman. Got Chris, a lovely, kindly face. Chris asks, uh, thoughts on the 100 draft and how it's done? In my view, uh, I think they're still not treating it with the respect it deserves. 3.2k watchers at the time of tweeting on YouTube. Not sure it's getting the hype it needs. We wouldn't get out of bed for less than 10 times that amount. <laughs> <yeah. laughs> uh, I, I think it's an interesting question. You know, um, I have said before that uh, the way in which people talk about county stream numbers uh, isn't, isn't quite accurate. Uh, you know, that many people, that, that's comparable to a, a, a normal day of county uh, championship uh, streaming numbers. Um, that's that's really not much for your, your premier competition, and you know you, you want to create hype uh, at something like this. This is should be exciting for for fans, and it's only on YouTube. I thought that was and TikTok. Uh, I th- <laughs> thought I thought that was that was weird. You know, I don't think there was anything else on on Sky Cricket at yeah. the time. Well, what, what were the TikTok figures? That's what we. That's true. That's true. <laughs> that's where, that's where the kids hold my are. hands up to that. Uh, um, <laughs> no, I, I don't know. I think I think um, I think these are fundamentally quite weird events uh, yes. as much as anything. Like it's. <laughs> It, it's what five six months until the hundred starts or four or five months anyway yeah. um it's quite a weird thing to just suddenly spring up in the middle of nowhere um it's quite hard to sort of build hype around a standalone event which is literally like you know uh giles white and stephen fleming on a zoom call uh deciding to pick akil hossein for 60 grand it's like even for you've yeah. got to be a pretty hardcore cricket fan to watch but then the hundred <laughs> is not really about hardcore cricket yeah. fans so it's in this sort of strange um intermediate position it was a very strange event yeah uh, a couple of moments that stand out uh charles dagnall putting an, an incredible shift in <laughs> essentially the, the the sole host but also analyzing all the moves as they were coming out <laughs> um he particularly took umbrage with uh birmingham phoenix women's side uh choosing three wicketkeeper batters um which i didn't quite understand as a criticism because you can still play all three of them um and then one of the one of the presenters whose name i don't i don't know uh made a comment about the whole building uh buzzing with excitement all day and given that the, that the draft took place in the shard i wasn't sure if that was necessarily true um anyway let's head to mark butcher for his thoughts on the jason roy news the alex hales not Lanka Premier League situation uh, and Butch's time in Pakistan and some great stories from the PSL. Butch, I wanted to ask you about Alex Hales and Jason Roy. And no, we're not um, mulling over who should open the batting at the Champions Trophy, but the pair of them are not necessarily going to be involved in key bits of the England white, English white ball summer next year. Jason Roy went unsold at the 100 draft yesterday and Alex Hales will be playing in the Lanka Premier League instead of the T20 Blast um, for at least half of the competition um, yeah. that was confirmed last week. On Roy, there are lots of reasons why he won't be going, but what was your reaction to to the news that, that Roy, who is such a big part of England's rise as a white ball force, won't be involved in the flagship domestic white ball competition? Um, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a continuation, really, that saw him left out of England's squad in the in the world t20 david milan was took over his spot there uh he had a, he had a really bad season last year in 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 england um in the hundred um couldn't buy a run uh and so you know i suppose if you took it in isolation then perhaps his standing his stock as a hundred player went down there but then you sort of run it forward misses out on on the england stuff had a relatively quiet SA20 no a, a pretty quiet SA20 really for, for somebody of his quality although there were glimpses that he was starting to, to find the sort of touch and form that we know that he can show at his very best um, and then you know right off the back of that you go PSL with Coetta and again sort of had had the odd sort of glimpse of, of Jason Roy of old but in the end the, the, the campaign was pretty unsatisfactory and then and by the end of it he was kind of shelling catches at long off and kind of looking looking like a shadow of his of himself in the field which is something that you you, you never really say about Jason so 
look, his stock has, has sort of been steadily in decline since last summer. Um, and I go back to something that, that occurred to me quite a long time ago, really. And that was when Alex Hales first retired from all red ball cricket, sort of in his, you know, in his 20s. And that for all of these players, and I'll always remember Kevin Peterson saying this, that once you actually stop playing any longer form cricket at a, at a lower level, whether it's domestic or, um, you know, for, for, uh, for, for other teams, state cricket elsewhere or whatever it is, if you find yourself in a situation whereby the runs dry up and you, you kind of, you're struggling a little bit for a bit of form and a bit of touch, there is nowhere for you to go competitively at a, at a slower pace to try and sort of rediscover whatever it was that made you the player that you were. Um, and, you know, over the course of, it's almost coming up a year now for, for, um, for Jason in particular, that slide has been really difficult to stop. Um, and of course, when you're one of the marquee players or somebody that's been put up for, for large, the top end anyway, in terms of um, bidding in auctions and your last two or three um, uh, franchise tournaments have gone badly, then it's, it, it sort of follows that people look elsewhere hmm. for cheaper options and for options of players who are actually being more productive than you are at the time. So look, it's, it, it's incredibly tough. But it's entirely understandable. Um, you know, I'd I'd love to see Jason make a make a decision, a reverse ferret, and go back and play play some red ball cricket. Well, play red ball cricket for Surrey and become a become a full full time professional player again, because I think that's probably the only way that you ever that you stand a chance of sort of maintaining um, your form and productivity over a long period. Because it's almost impossible to do if you're if you're expected to go out there and crack the thing around. In the power play, you find yourself not scoring any runs. The confidence takes a dip. The technique falls apart. Where the hell do you rebuild it again? Mm. How, how how strongly do you, do you feel that that that's necessary for players who prioritise T Twenty cricket? Um, there are obviously examples of of players who have decent T Twenty careers who don't play red ball cricket. But it's just quite interesting because Moeen Ali said very similar to what you just said in a recent interview. Mm. Um, ben spoke to Phil Salt a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, he's he's a player who people see as a, you know, a, a, the ultimate power play basher. But he's actually also someone who averages 43 in the championship over the last two years and says he really values just batting time. He, he talked about one game where he was just like, this is amazing. I get to I just get to keep batting. Um, yeah. How, how, how essential do you think it is even for players who are the power? power I, think, players I think it's absolutely essential. Batting is batting, batting, some batting time feeling as though you can make conscious decisions to kind of to, to let ball go, let balls go, take your time and pick the right ball to hit is utterly essential. I think, I mean, listen, I, I, I can't, I can't talk from personal experience. I, you know, I, I was always playing everything um, at the time or, or probably less white ball stuff than, than red ball. But the, the idea that you would kind of, that, that, that literally every time you walk to the wicket, you had to be, you had to be 20 off eight balls. And then go on to make seventy or eighty to to sort of make sure that your team got a got a big um, big enough score batting first or in a run chase or whatever it was, um, and you never ever had the opportunity to take your foot off the throttle a little bit and have a think about um, you know how, how the hands are coming down, how you're moving, and all the rest of it, it would be an absolute anathema to to me. Um, and look, there, as you said, there are players who, who have done it. A lot of those players perhaps weren't particularly weren't particularly suited at all to, to the four day game. Um, and therefore, you know, less, less expectation, particularly if you're somebody that bats sort of lower middle order and you're kind of, you're looking to crash it around and you have a ready made excuse for non productivity, I suppose. But if, if you're being sold as a top three or four player, hmm. then you have to score, you have to score a volume of runs and you have to do them at pace. Um, and, and if that is the only cricket you're playing, it's very, very easy to kind of fall into a rut where you can't, you don't know where your next run is coming from. The strike rate then falls as well. And before before you know it, your enormous price tag that you were selling for um, three years previous has disappeared because no mm. one will pay it um, because the numbers simply don't support um, uh, shelling out that sort of money for you. And, and do you think, especially as a top order batter, the white ball swings loads, not for long, but it does swing loads mm. in the first two, three, four overs. Is, is it actually quite important to just have the the red ball fundamentals even if you are a t20 opener i don't know about the yeah i mean of course 
most of these guys sort of grew up playing Red Bull cricket, so they've kind of got a basis in that anyway. And they, you know, understand um, technically that that's that that's required. Um, the difficulty the difficulty is that you know if you go in, if your reputation is as somebody that gets teams off to the flyers and, and all the rest of it, you, it becomes a little bit sort of self fulfilling in that you you want to try and put back to ball. The more you want to put back to ball, the more chance you have of nicking it. Um, the more time you give yourself, uh, the, the more you feel under pressure to kind of to live up to the to the strike rates that you're supposed to be achieving. Um, you know, in fact, there's a, there was a pretty good example, not exactly the same thing, but Multan in the, in the final of the PSL I've just come back from had played brilliant cricket as far as I was concerned on on sort of trickyish pitches by getting off relatively slowly. Mohammed Rizwan sort of taking his time. Make, ended up sort of making 70 odd, 60 or 70 or 50 balls and then handing it over to the guys who finished off the innings in a flourish. And then in the final, he slogged one up in there in the first over. They all looked like their, their backsides were on fire and completely threw the, threw the game plan out of the window. Um, and so the example I, I'm giving there is of, a, a, is of success being achieved by actually giving yourself a little bit more time in that power play when the ball is moving around. And then I know you can't catch up, but then sort of making making totals and scores that are then serviceable to your bowling attack on the other end. They threw it out the window and lost. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's not exactly the same thing, but it kind of ties into what you're saying. And that there is there is always time, particularly for these guys who are fantastic ball strikers like Hales and Roy, to kind of just get yourself in for a little while and then and then go about your business. But um, you know. <laughs> Lack of form means lack of confidence, which then means clouded thinking, which means that that something that seems relatively obvious from the outside, and it's always a damn sight easier sitting in the sitting in the commentary box, becomes something that you can't see and can't feel yourself when you're out there in the middle. Mm. And on Alex Hales, um, slightly different situation. He's opted out of the second half of the Blast group stage. So for for those who haven't poured over the 2024 calendar. The Blast group stage is split into two. There are a couple of rounds of the championship in between the two uh, parts. And the second part pretty much exactly overlaps with the Lanka Premier League. The Lanka Premier League, I think, starts on the 1st of July. The Blast gets going again on the 3rd of July. Hales has opted to play in the Lanka Premier League over the second part of the Blast group stage. He'll be available for the knockouts, which take place later in the summer, should not get there. Hales has a white ball only contract with Knotts has done for some time. Uh, mm. Knotts publicly, at least, have said they are okay with it. Butch, what do you make of it? <laughs> um, well, I mean, Knotts have said they're okay with it, so it's fine, right? I, I'd imagine if I was a if I was a, a Knotts fan, I'd be I'd, I'd have probably be losing my shit um, <laughs> with this because they would feel as though you know we've kind of bent over backwards to to accommodate. Alex's wishes and wants over the years and he's been you know he's been a fantastic player and a part of a very successful um, Nottinghamshire white ball outfit for, for quite some time but this one kind of feels a little bit like really you, you, you're making you're making that choice over this um, and it's of course it's it's financially related and once once you allow players the um, the freedom to kind of pick finances over any loyalty that might be there then these are the types of things that happen. But I think I would I would imagine that if I was a Knotts fan, I would think, well, we've probably we've probably done enough to accommodate um, Alex over the last ten years or so, and it would have been quite nice if he'd have chosen us over then. Mm. Um, moving on back to the PSL, um, amazing final. There are a few players I wanted to to pick out. Usman Khan is a name that people in England probably won't know a lot about. He's in his late twenties. Um, he made the decision to move to the UAE in pursuit of opportunities that he felt he wasn't getting and he wasn't getting a fair go, basically, in Pakistan for for what, for what his talent, basically. Um, he will soon qualify for the UAE, but he could play for Pakistan, as you said earlier, tomorrow if he wanted to. Um, he's got, mm. got an amazing PSL record. He's got 300s. Um, he averages cl- close to 40 from not that many games. He's got a Bangladesh Premier League Hundred as well. He's he's basically played nothing domestically in Pakistan. Um, yeah. The T Twenty World Cup is around the corner. Pakistan have tried a lot of guys who haven't done that well for Pakistan. How how good do you think this guy is? Is he someone who who, who Pakistan should be t- having a look at? Um, 
I'm, I'm sure they are having a look at him. I mean, he, th there was one there was one slight chink in the armour that, that we hadn't seen before. Um, and that might just have been because the pitches in Karachi were a little, little bit too paced over the, the sort of playoffs. When Nassim Shah and uh, Fahim Ashraf were kind of bumping him and, and getting him into all sorts of trouble. But up until that point, I'd not seen anything that he didn't do well. You know, he was brilliant against spin or front or back foot, either coming down the pitch or, or square cutting them, slog sweeping them. Um, against the quicks, he seemed to have an answer to, to pretty much everything. Uh, and as you said, he made he made two hundreds and a ninety in the, in the tournament this year um, against some pretty tasty bowling from time to time. Um, and so, you know, I guess the the question for Pakistan is where would where would they fit him in if they decided that he was um, that he was the, their guy? Uh, the, the chances are that you'll see Rizwan and Baba open the batting. Although there's a pretty good argument for having same are you going up up on top as a left right? Opening partnership and then maybe Baba at three, um, and then you could you could fit him in at number four potentially. Uh, he keeps wicket as well, um, so that there is a chance. And then the, the more tantalising for me, I mean, listen, I, I think he's a fabulous player, and I think they'd be very foolish not to not to try and entice him away from qualifying for the UAE. But then you, then you have this very interesting um, middle order phase, um, which could go something like um, sort of Iftikhar. Um, have I, have I missed somebody obvious? As I'm Khan. Who the, the, the regular guys are. I well, guess no, Fakir Fak Zaman has played Riz a lot historically, but is all yeah. out of form at the moment. Rizwan, but Rizwan, I think, would, would keep wicket. And I'd probably go for Rizman Khan over Azam Khan um, anyway. Uh, and then you've sort of got the, the likes, the sort of hitters, the, the engine room in, in the middle order. You could have guys like... Um, Iftikhar, Imad Wazim, who, who famously sort of retired from international cricket and then 24 hours later said he might have been being a bit hasty after Karachi's nightmare um, tournament last year when he was captain, but he was brilliant. And then, of course, he, he put in three player of the match um, performances or at least worthy performances in the in the playoffs for Islamabad this time round with bat and ball. And how Mohamed Nawaz has been playing in front of him in any form of white ball cricket over the last two or three years. People might remember me saying this. Um, <laughs> I will never know, but uh, but he certainly could be back in the running again. And then they've got a couple of all-rounders, the likes of Ahmed Jamal, who I think is really, really talented. Uh, bowls a really heavy ball. Uh, you know, has a gives Pakistan an option that they haven't had for a little while. This sort of um, you know the diasm of mood. Um, Abdul Razak type player at seven yeah. or eight or whatever gives them that bit of depth, and then of course you've got all of the the fabulous fast bowlers and and uh, Asama Mir, the leg spinner, mm. to go along with a, a bunch of other sort of bowlers. Iftikhar can bowl um, spin. Saima Yu was very successful bowling in power play with his Karen balls and off spinners. So they went, they, you know, if with a bit of with a bit of smartness, they could end up putting out a team that is actually very very well equipped. And you got Shadab Khan of, in there as well. And Shadab, yes, of course, and Shadab as well. So, I mean, you've got you've got depth, you've got variety in bowling, you've got death bowling, you've got spin bowling, and you've got batters who can slam it from mm. from one to eight or nine. Um, and they start to look with, you know, and, and it's basically a, a case of selection, really, I think, or getting the right people in um, whose, whose jobs it match up to what their talents are. Um, and they could be a real force to be reckoned with in this World Cup, mm. as, as they always can. But I think, I think the last time, in particular, they were hamstrung by just having the wrong personnel mm. um, in the in the squad. Yeah, I mean, just on his man again, his, his story is is mad. He mm. he basically got he was granted a visa to work in the UAE, um, hoping to qualify for them, and has been working in a shop. Um, yeah, to, sort of by by this time, you know, this this guy could be back yeah. and forth for Pakistan in the World Cup. And yeah, he's, he's, he's without without last... any question, and, and yeah. he, he is he's seriously seriously good, and he and he offers them something that they kind of that perhaps again they haven't they haven't had, um, you know, somebody who is capable of capable of strike rates in the one sixties and one seventies is also capable of making big runs. Hmm. Um, they you know the, the likes of Iftikhar etc. With, with all due respect, are, are more likely to to make you a a, you know, a 12 ball 30 or 40 or something. But this guy has, has shown on more than one occasion the sort of mm. the ability to go in um, with plenty of overs to go and make it and make it really count, make uh, make big scores. So uh, it'd be very interesting to see what they do. Mm. I mean, the the, um, the 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 processes around um, selection and who gets picked are sometimes a little bit 
a little bit mind blowing over there. But one thing is sure, um, there is talent all over the place in Pakistan. And one thing in the in the PSL that I've noticed probably over the last two years is that you know the talk was always about the, the fast bowlers, the fast bowl bowling production line that they have over there. But in the last two years, I reckon there have been three or four um, young batters who have really sort of stood up and elevated the competition because that was always the side of it that was that slightly let it down. But I think, you know, Saeem and, and I mean, Usman Khan's not young, um, but there are, there are some players there now in the batting ranks who kind of, who get the billing as, as high as some of the, the young bowlers like mm. Nassim Shah do. Um, and finally, just on Imad Wasim, uh, extraordinary tournament, Pfeiffer in the final, crucial runs as well. Um, mm. He's been around for ages and, and we're aware of, 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 his, of how good he is, but he has been so consistently good in this competition uh, when it's 6.6 run and over, uh, pretty much a full run and over better than those bowlers who bowled a comparable um, amount yeah. of overs. Um, a, what what makes him so effective as a finger spinner? Um, and two, should Pakistan do absolutely everything to, to try and get him to reverse his decision um, to retire from international cricket? Yeah, well, I think I think the two things are the two things are highly linked um, in terms of what makes him. You know, why 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 is the bowling so effective? Um, what makes him what makes him sort of uh, a player that they should want in the in the team? Um, and they're both pretty much that they're, they're the same thing. I think he's unbelievably cool under fire, um, very very unemotional. Reads pitch conditions very, very quickly, both bowling and batting. Um, you know, we, we saw him take take all the pace off the ball bowling in the in the final um, on a, on a pitch where the ball didn't really turn if you if you fired it in, but but would if you if you took the pace off. He was brave in that regard. He was brave in the um, eliminated two when they were five down, weren't they against um, against Zalmi? Or four down for fifty or something and dead, dead and buried. And he mm. basically came out and I watched. I, from about the tenth over, I think halfway through the eleventh over, I watched him very calmly just nudge a ball just wide of extra cover and take one. And I think I said on comms at the time, I said this is the kind of batting that starts to scare the life out of you as a as a, as a fielding captain, because he's basically taking he t- took one every ball he faced pretty much, and then inevitably a bad ball will come come along. That went for four, and they go at tens without taking any risks, and they won it with an over to spare. You know, he and Hyder Ali Hyder Ali put his foot down at the back end, and they won the game. And it was just so calculating and so unemotional and so almost un-Pakistani in a way <laughs> that it was inevitable that they were going to take out that run chase. Mm. Um, and in all three innings in those knockout matches that they won back to back, his bowling was exactly the same. Yeah, Very, very clever, very calm, read the conditions brilliantly and came out with, with figures of, you know, one, two, three for nothing in all three games. So, you know, if you're telling me there's a better option than him as a utility player, um, with experience, with big match temperament, and all the rest of it, then um, then I want to see him. Mm. Well, maybe maybe that's it. He's he's just not box office enough. He's he's too consistent for this <laughs> he's, he's, setup. He's, <laughs> he's too chilled. I mean, they really need a bit of chilled. Um, and he's yeah. I, I don't know how many times you can prove it. You know, that's yeah. that's the point. You see pl- a lot of players who've got flashy shots and a kind of you know bowl bowl the odd brilliant delivery, but then when when the, when the pressure comes on, they kind of you know they wilt, but he mm. he kind of gets bigger the, the the more difficult or the more pressure is on. So mm. you need guys like that in your team if you're going to win tournaments. Mm. Absolutely. Well, cheers for your time, Butch. Catch you next week. Cheers, mate. The IPL starts tomorrow. There are 13 English players. Involved, we've got Moeen Ali, Phil Salt, David Willey, Luke Wood, Johnny Bairstow, Liam Livingston, Sam Curran, uh, Chris Wokes, Josh Butler, Tom Kohler, Cadmore, Will Jacks, Reese Topley, and Tom Curran. Um, before we talk about the IPL in particular, um, there's a T20 World Cup around the corner, Matt. Who are the English players who could really change the England plans going into that competition? Um, I think I, I sense you're looking for a bolter. Um, uh, no, I think, not necessarily. I, I mean, there, there aren't many options for bolters <laughs> because most of them currently play for. Yeah, well, I think that I think the potential bolter is Luke Wood um, because of the fact that he hasn't really had much of a run in mm. in England's colours, um, and, and he might because, actually play because yeah. there are a few injuries at so, Mumbai. Yeah, Mumbai have have sort of have 
Madashenka and Berendorf have been ruled out. Mm. We've replaced Berendorf and a 17 year old quick from South Africa who mm. did well in the under 19 World Cup has replaced yeah. Madashenka. And I think Kurtzia might be injured as well, so or have a niggle at least. So yeah. I think Wood will start. Um, he's he's a, he's a very exciting bowler. He's basically pitched it up and um, tries to swing it and sometimes gets whacked and sometimes mm. blows people's pads off. And, Quick, um, don't he? He is, yeah, yeah. Um, so, it could, it could, you know, if he has a good start to the comp and he could suddenly emerge, it's quite an mm. exciting option. But mm. I think from England's point of view, the main team of interest and sort of group of players of interest is Punjab Kings. Yeah, um, that's quite half of them. Yeah. Where they have four players uh, and Bayless as coach. Um, but Bairstow hasn't played a lot of T20 cricket mm. in the last 18 months, basically, since even before his leg break, he hadn't played for six months. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see where he fits in, how he does. He's the only England player that will do all three of World Cup, India Test Tour and IPL this winter. So pretty mm. long slog, especially he's you know, got a young family and all that. Um, and then Livingston and Curran, I mentioned at the top of the show, but both of them have had pretty quiet periods over the last year or so. Um, and, and both of them, um, should be in England's first team. They were in the long-term mm. planning for the, for the T20 World Cup, but probably need to put some performances in. Um, and Chris Wokes again, be quite interesting. Doesn't play a huge amount of T20 cricket compared to some other people. And, and, you know, we know what a, a, a dangerous asset he'll be with a new ball if he's, uh, you know, on mm. form and, in the right uh in the right space but um yeah i think i think those four will be interesting and they probably won't all play yeah. um in the same team just by nature of the fact that they've i think they've got ellis rubada russo and raza as the other four mm. overseas so it's quite a strong set of eight um and yeah i think um be interesting to track how those four all get on I, I was looking at what i think the top five will be for england at the world cup and you've got stokes who said he's available for the tournament bairstow who's not played much but you'd think he'd come in salt has paid a lot recently. Jax has paid a lot recently. If those two guys come in and you've got Brooke as well, obviously, it's not actually... One of those guys got to drop out and three of those guys are playing the IPL um, in, in Salt, Jax and Bairstow. So I guess there's a real opportunity for someone to make themselves undroppable. Um, I guess Salt and Bairstow probably more likely to play than Jax. It's yeah. actually looking at who RCB have. Not that clear how Jax gets in. Yeah, I think it's sadly for Jax, I think he's probably going to spend most of the season on the bench barring an injury, which mm. obviously can happen. But um, yeah, just looking at that, they're going to start with uh, Faf, Maxwell and Cameron Green, who they've spent a lot of money on between mm. the three of them. Um, and Jax looks like more of a squad player. But mm. um, the other interesting one, I doubt he'll get a game. Uh, he might play at some point through injury, but Tom Curran mm. is quite interesting because he's become, he, he obviously had that phase of being a slower ball specialist and then kind of got found out a bit and dipped mm. off and has had quite a few injuries over the last three, four years as well. Um, but has, has reinvented himself somewhat in that he looks like he's been signed as a backup for Cameron Green and is more of almost a, a batting all rounder, like mm. a power hitter. Um, Nowadays. He's, he's done very well in, in England doing yeah, that over the last 12 months. Did, yeah, did really well in the 100 last year. Obviously, yeah. sort of turned around that that final at Lords against um, Manchester. Um, so, yeah, it'd be, be really interesting to see how he went if he got a game. But, um, mm. yeah, I don't I don't necessarily think he will. And I suppose the, the other the other one to, to keep an eye on, it's a pretty obvious name, but Joss Butler had a, a stunning IPL 2022 and a pretty quiet IPL 2023. Um, he obviously had a really, really tough World Cup in India. Um, and you feel like it, Butler is the sort of player where if he puts together a run of seven games in the World Cup in June, mm. England will probably go very deep and will probably, you know, reach the final. If, yeah. And if he has a really tough time and can't buy a run like in India, then they probably won't get past the Super 8s. It, it actually feels like it's been quite a long time in terms of cricket played since Butler's actually been in really good nick. Yeah, it, he had he did have a good 100. Um mm. But again, that's I, I suppose you know that's the standard he should be dominating. Um, but I, yeah, I agree in terms of international cricket. Um, it, yeah, it's probably not been quite as dominant as he was for mm. a period. And um, yeah, last last IPL, I think he ended with I think he ended with more ducks than fifties, um, mm. which yeah, <laughs> it doesn't reflect hugely well. <laughs> um, but yeah, he, he, you know he's good enough. And that, that yeah. top three at Rajasthan of Joyce Well, Butler, Sampson looks pretty fun, doesn't it, on paper? So that does um, that'll be that'll be good fun to watch. I think Butler is well worth watching closely. I have a feeling that he'll have a good tournament. I have a feeling that he'll have a good win, a good summer as well with England. Yeah, agreed. That he's had a break now. Um, there's a bit more clarity in in the role that he now he now has. You know, there's no more murmurs about 
you know, been involved in the test side and so on and so on. Um, but the relentlessness of his career in the last few years, you know, no one's carried out more air miles than he has, uh, will have taken its toll. And he's quite an introspective bloke and, and he, is, he is given to, 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 to reflections on how things have gone. And you saw how shot he was at the end of the World Cup. You know, you could see it in his eyes. He was making strange decisions. Um, they got away from from their identity a little bit, and I think perhaps he he did himself. So, so I think the last few months, him just being able to take a breather and just step away from a game that can eat you up, no matter mm. who you are, is is necessary for him. Um, mm. So yeah, I hope that I hope that he comes in and and nails it. Uh, I have a good feeling for it. Yeah, um, big news today. MS Dhoni's resigned as the Chennai Super Kings captain it the means day after we went to print and <laughs> i wrote yesterday in one of the captions don't he still leading the troops blah 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 43 years young <laughs> yeah it's, it's, it, it'll, it'll still be there um always. but it does mean that this is the first ever ipl to not have one of the big three skippering i guess i mean don't has been, been been there throughout um i guess um but i sort of thinking bigger picture where where is the ipl heading as a tournament and i want to go to phil first rather than matt on this um i <laughs> What do you think, Matt? <laughs> <laughs> um, in in the where where do you feel uh, the the IPL is heading? Because for a tournament that makes this much money, right? Yeah, it is actually objectively surprising that it's so short. Sure, you know, cricket fans, sure. a lot of cricket fans in England won't like hearing that. Sure, but it is surprising, I think, that it hasn't expanded in India as much as it as it could it's, have it's, done. It's become a, a decacorn. Yes. What does that mean? Something that's worth ten billion dollars. Okay. Um, second richest league in the world by, by certain measures, uh, mm. sports league in the world. Where does it go? Uh, probably expands a bit more uh, to cover a bit more time within India. But obviously the way that it's going is that you will eventually have players that are on 12-month contracts who play three months in India rather than whatever it is now, two and a half, two, two and a half. And then you'll have a breather and then you'll play a month in America. Saudi. <laughs> And then a bit in Saudi. Mm. And obviously the SA20 as well is, is all partnered up as well. Perhaps it's only a matter of time before private investment comes into the 100. I'd be interested on your thoughts on that, Matt. And, and, and if that does happen, then you can see one or two hefty oligarchs queuing up um, from, from, from Indian cricket to, to get their hands on that. And then you'll see the money skyrocket in the 100 as well. Uh, and yeah, I mean, that's how I see it. I see Joss Butler one day playing for Rajasthan, basically contracted 12 months of the year or a Joss Butler equivalent. It might come slightly too late for him, but hmm. but essentially that. Uh, and I think that's probably inevitable. It, it, it's, it's, it's quirky. It's idiosyncratic that you have this extraordinary commercial behemoth that is nonetheless still squeezed hmm. into a small part of the, the calendar. Now, the comparison, obviously, is the NFL, where you know I think it runs from September to March, or maybe February. February, think, yeah, yeah. February, yeah, September to February, which again is is only four months for a twelve month of the year monster. Mm. Uh, but I think with cricket, I think it will have it will inevitably just expand itself uh, until until players are identified first and foremost. As, as representatives of Chennai or whatever it may be. And if they're fortunate enough to be picked to play international cricket, then that, that will be a basis for negotiation, but nothing more than that. Mm. Um, Matt, it sort of feels is like... That, is that anywhere near how you see it? Yeah, yeah, I think so. What were you... Sorry, yes, what were you going to... I was just going to say that it feels like the T20 franchise landscape outside of... is, is not 100% true, but outside of the IPL-owned stuff feels quite messy... Sometimes, you know, you get ran, genuinely quite random competitions that are quite hard to understand how they make money or what, what the point of them is. Um, do, you, do you think that almost the IPL will just increasingly just take control of, of the T20 landscape um, and, and, and more competitions sort of are in line with the IPL teams? Yeah, potentially. I, I, I think from the franchise's point of view, what I don't, fully understand at the moment and i think it makes some kind of sense in you know diversifying the investments and building up the brand worldwide but i don't fully understand why there hasn't been more of a push to just mm. make the season longer than it is because 
if I yeah if I was owning a, an IPL franchise which has affiliates in various different countries I would be thinking these kind of feel like pale imitations of what we've got at home is there really no way we can make this bigger and better and I think in you know I think as Phil says in time you can see a world in which you know you have a three or four month IPL a month of it might be played in Saudi or Dubai or wherever it is um, and you you try and carve out a bigger window in the Indian summer for it because it is it is curious at the moment that it has ha- sort of hardly expanded mm. in the past 15 years because uh, you know since about th- there was a point where they had they moved from eight to ten teams in about 2010 2011 I think um, they had Pune and Kochi then um, and there has been a gradual change in sort of teams coming and going and stuff like that but for it's the not most really part, got yeah the, for the number of yeah. fixtures and the number of teams has been pretty similar Mm. for throughout its existence despite the fact it's power and influence and you know the indian economy has changed and grown massively in that period india as a country has changed massively in that period there are so many massive cricket stadiums in india that just don't get used yeah a a, hundred percent so um and and another possible outcome could be that if they because they're smart right and they realize that even in india which seems insatiable for cricket among the punters you do still run the risk of overcooking it if you run 20 over cricket every night for three and a half months, mm. uh, only to get to a point where you play a semi final and a final and it's done in three hours. It's not like a league in, in other sports where you build up over a period of time. So it's possible that they could change the, the structure of it, the scheduling of it. It's possible yeah. that they could. They could even kind of have the equivalent of international breaks as you have in football, for example, right? You could have a month, you could have then a week, two weeks off, you could play a couple of test matches or whatever, yeah. play an ODI series, um, and then come back refreshed. So you do have a, you have a bit of a breather and the, the consumer has a breather for yeah. what, what they're confronted with. Another option could be potentially that you have it in effect like an FA Cup style mm. version within, within an IPL season. So it's not relentlessly just that, that, that group and, and, waiting for the t- the final four and it can become even though the games in themselves are often great it can still become an interminable process right yeah as, as a as a as a competition so there's all kinds of options for them but i think the one the one inevitability of it is that they will expand it and eat further into the rest of the 12 month calendar mm. and obviously if the money is there which it will be for sure the players are going to say thanks very much. And, and just to touch on uh, what you said about none of the big three being captains mm. this year, I did. I, I spent uh, most of last year's IPL in India, and I was taken aback by I think, or the, I, one of my main takeaways from it was just how closely the uh, the sort of the fandom is has was linked to players rather than teams. I found mm. in that by a distance, the three biggest teams are Mumbai, Chennai, and RCB. And the reason for each of those are Rohit, mm. MS Dhoni, and Virat Kohli. And th- there was no question about that. You know, I, I would, this is anecdotal, but speak to someone who would say, you know, I'm from like a, I don't know, a cab driver or someone in a restaurant or whoever it was, say, I, I'm from Uttar Pradesh. And I'd be like, all oh, right, so you would support, uh, do you support the new Lucknow team? And they said, no, 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 I support Chennai, obviously, because of Dhoni. Mm. And c- c- can, I, can I ask, how is, is this reflected financially? Well, it, you know, so so Kings Eleven never won it. They're not called yeah. Eleven anymore, are they? Yeah, Punjab dropped Kings. the Eleven. Sorry, yeah. Punjab Kings never won it. They're not one of the big three, as you say. Uh, how does that affect their ability to build a huge roster as set against, say, a Chennai or a, or a Mumbai? Well, in terms of the the roster, I don't think it's massively different. I think some, I think players are probably slightly more likely to pull out of stints with certain teams because of the fact they have a reputation as not always staying in the best hotels or scrimping a little bit on transport or whatever So that's it is. where it shows its but, face. Yeah, but I think it's probably more through sort of the commercial side of it. So if you, if I, I don't have the numbers uh, to hand, but if you pull up Instagram now and look at the number of followers mm. by team, I think RCB, Mumbai and Chennai between the three of them would probably have more than the other seven combined. And I don't think it would be that close either. Um, so like they are, they are huge brands comparatively. And if you look at how it's presented on, on TV and on streaming, yeah, those are the teams that people care about. And those are the players that people care right. about. So it is interesting, this generation of the, where we sort of, the, the, you know, you had that captain's photo shoot and you're sort of thinking, oh yeah, I, I think I know everyone in this, but is that just their Sharma stepping in as mm. Punjab's vice captain for this photo shoot or whatever. And it does feel like you have a slightly, 
you, ha- you almost have this generation of players who are now in their late 20s or even early 30s who have for so long been you know the obvious successors to these huge celebrity names who haven't quite stepped out of yeah. the shadow yet and maybe we're starting to you know maybe Hardick and Shubman Gill and Jai Swell himself will will get to that that point before long and they'll start to be associated with the teams in the way that um, feels like Hardick is is the closest to, yeah, to sort of cracking I th- it I think like, that's right he's got such great IPL pedigree the, yeah the profile but um, um I thought it was very interesting there was, a, there was an interview uh that Sky Sports did with Manoj Badali the the owner of, of Radisson Royals and he made quite an interesting point. Uh, so you have these mega auctions in the IPO every three years and you're only allowed to retain three or four players. And they retain Jaiswal where Jaiswal actually didn't have much of an IPO record. Um, and, you know, if you're looking at who could be a, a big three like figure in 15 years time, Jaiswal is absolutely one of those. And I guess that is such a big part of, of, of a, as you say, of a team's potential brand is is locking in someone for ages. Um, and and I guess the hope would be that you you manage to get the next Coley. Um, yeah, absolutely. And and like this year, even though there are quite a few, even though teams know going into this year that they mm. are only going to be able to retain probably four. Right? Obviously, they they'll decide the details of that soon. But not very many players. Um, quite a lot of teams still sort of sort the next big thing in the auction. Mm. There are a couple of fairly unknown players yeah. with very minimal T Twenty experience who have gone for big money. Um, and often, you know, age 18, 19 in some cases. Um, so it will be interesting to see whether those guys play and, and also then if they, you know, it, as a team, do you do you try and retain your overseas superstar who might have two years left or do you try and retain the, you know, the, the guy who could carry your brand forward for mm. the next six, seven, eight years? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and we're not going to like preview, preview the, t- the, t- the tournament today. Um, but you know, just looking through the squads, I thought, Actually, a lot of them look very similar on paper. And I've seen the point made that the last year in a mega auction cycle tends to be closer because I guess you've got two years, two yeah. opportunities to to close the gap. It, another interesting storyline to, ke- to te- keep your eye on is um, the, the fixtures have only, uh, only fi- the first 21 fixtures have been released. Um, they've got m- elections in India and in previous Years where there've been elections in India during the IPL, they've actually moved the IPL to a diff- to different countries. So um, still up in the air what, yeah. what the rest of the tournament looks like. I think there are some there are likely to be some massive scheduling crunches as well yeah. because when elections, so even last season there were some state elections in uh, Karnataka, uh, which is where Bangalore is, um, and at some I think RCB played something like four home games in ten days, mm. and then we're on a three week road trip during those elections, and then suddenly came home at the end, mm. and it can you know obviously. Uh, maybe we read too much into scheduling and a lot of T20 games are relatively close anyway, but um, yeah, it, it could could play a big uh, four, role in the outcome. Four, four, four home games in 10, you'd take that in the blast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a luxury. Um, well, next up, we've got a ch- great chat between Ben and the, and the Kent duo, uh, Tawanda Muyeye, and their newly appointed skipper, Daniel Belldrummond. Phil, um, Muyeye is, is really really good yeah i'm gonna bore people rigid over the summer talking about <laughs> this kid uh if you haven't seen him go and watch him book an hour book a day off you know pack a <laughs> pack some sarnies don't don't hold a whole day on him because he's not yet quite that player but an hour of him is worth a few weeks of other good players because he is special mm. he, exhibit a he made 41 in 42 balls or something, or 42 and 41 balls or something like that here at the Oval last year for Kent. He made two 40s and the second innings 40 containing nine fours in about 45 minutes, mm. all the 40s. And we all know that the great hipster players make 40s. It was absolutely obscenely good. Obscenely yeah. good. There's an economy of movement, the way that the kid goes about it, but there's a crispness to how he hits it. He's already involved in the Oval Invincible side, but he hasn't really got going yet. And he hasn't really been given a chance in, in the Invincible side. But I think this year you'll see him. He'll make some Red Bull runs. He's made, he made a big 170 in a 300-plus partnership that with probably Bell Ben, ben will yeah, talk yeah. about. Yeah, because it was with uh, uh, Bell Drummond. Um, again, you look at some of the shots from that innings. Just, just spectacular, really. Mm. A sublime player. Still getting going. Might not crack it because... Cricket's mad and weird, uh, but get along and watch him, honestly. He's yeah. special. What I'd say is um, you might look at his numbers and he's 23 years old and he averages low 30s. 
in first class cricket and you go like what, what, what's the fuss about um well he, his story is quite something in that he he's a refugee born in zimbabwe um and wasn't actually able to play that much cricket while whilst his status was was uncertain so in terms of cricketing experience he he's, he is younger than, than than 23 he only made his professional debut in 2021 um only really got a proper go in the red bull team uh last season and and lots of people in english cricket really really rate him so yeah, he, he, i think he's and so much so that properly one to watch so much summer. so that they are trying they've got their best lobbyists on the <laughs> on the case to try and reduce that four year uh, qualification period that he still has to mm. serve it's got very much Joffre archer echoes this one mm. um, and if it takes four years or it takes three or two then yeah he'll still be he'll still be right for a for a career at the top because of the way that they talk of him and the way the uh, DVD talks about him on this this yeah. this bit here shows how how highly he's regarded. Yeah, and it's a, it's a really interesting chat for for other reasons as well. Like Bell, Bell Drummond been at Kent since he was seven years old, becoming their captain. Uh, he's only thirty actually. He's been around for so long. I sort of presumed he's older, but top top um, top bracket of players who haven't ever got a cap. And yeah, had, had a really good good year in in, in twenty twenty three. And, uh, you know, there's obvious significance in that there are so few black professional cricketers um, and these are two of them and one of them is, is, is leading their county. So they're, they're both significant figures for, for reasons more than just their, their batting. Um, anyway, here is that chat that Ben had with Mia and Bill Drummond. So I guess the obvious place to start is North Ants last year. Uh, so they made, what, 237... Ben Compton's out early. You must be thinking like, this could be doing a bit. And then you two put on, what, 300? Uh, <laughs> that must have been quite a good day of batting that you had. Yeah, it was a, it was an awesome partnership. Um, to be honest, I'd probably say the same for you. I was just cooked from the schedule. So um, I was thinking, compo T, please don't get out. I need to go to bed. We just filled it all day. Um, and then, yeah, compo got out. And yeah, it wasn't, it was quite a flat wicket. Obviously it turned out to be very flat, but Kookaburra ball um, was feeling quite good. And then T was on his, a mission himself. So I could just sort of glide in behind him and uh, get through to the end of the day on 40 odd T obviously had 50 by then. And uh, yeah, that was the start of it. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, for me, um, that innings was probably like just a weight off my shoulders. Um, I think it was a couple of years of trying to get a hundred um, and I finally did it. And obviously no one better to be doing it with um, than Deeb's. Um, and obviously I had the best seat in the house for that triple. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think we'll always remember that game as Deeb's triple century day. Um, but yeah, obviously I was just a bit relieved and I got to do it with one of my um, good friends in the team. Yeah. So do, do you see like batting together then? Because you're, you're not like a, it's not as if you're a blocker, but if you're just letting him sort of, play his strokes and you can sort of settle in sort of thing yeah i really enjoy it really enjoy batting with him he's got so much talent he uh he just yeah he, he's gonna reach the next level and it's just cool to see down the other end um he's quite inexperienced he's 22 but missed a few years out with covid and qualifying to be a local so i think um he's got so much more to learn and the sky's the limit but um yeah it's always enjoyable batting with him also in the t20 stuff as well um, just seeing some of the shots he played um, is unbelievable. So yeah, I do really enjoy it. Mm. I'm 23 actually. Um, just turned, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you um, in India, so. But yeah, we do enjoy batting together. And I don't know, we're both pretty attacking batsmen, but we seem to complement each other pretty well. Like if one is pretty much on the front foot, the other one takes a back step. Um, so yeah, I don't know, it's weird, but we do complement each other pretty well, especially in the T20s and in the four-day stuff. We had another partnership here. Again, Surrey in the four-day stuff, which is pretty good as well. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It just works, I think. Yeah, definitely. I think we were kind of swapped, didn't we? Like I started, then you I, you came in, and it was yeah. good to just play with you. And, um, and yeah, especially in uh, the Oval was a good evening, wasn't it? Yeah, South it London, obviously, from down the road. T loves London. And, yeah, it was good yeah. fun. You had a lot of friends in the crowd, didn't you? Yeah. A lot of people you knew. And to get a 100 partnership at the Oval on Sky was really special. We didn't win. Obviously, that's the main thing. Got to focus on the team goals. But it was, yeah, I won't forget that anytime soon. And I hope you don't. Even when you're but with the stars, don't don't forget me when you're around the world doing the franchise stuff. Remember those partnerships. 
yeah, uh, you, I mean, I will. You two obviously get on pretty well. Do you remember <laughs> meeting for the first time? Did you click straight away or was it a sort of a slow build friendship kind of thing? He hated me, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's a few things. So around COVID, Michael Yardy was the coach, mm-hmm. uh, batting coach, and he's obviously Sussex-based. T Tawanda played Sussex Juniors and was telling me about this young kid and Treadwell. So he was at the same sc- working at the same school as Tawanda. So I'd heard a lot about him. He won the Winston Cricketer of the Year. Same thing I'd won about ten years before, f- uh, eight years before, and um, and then he actually gave me a call. Uh, Paul Downton wanted Tawanda to speak to me, or vice versa, and. I just told him how Kent was and that I think he'd really enjoy it because a few counties were rightly so after him. So, um, no, I, that's the first time I spoke to him. And then the first time I saw him was mm-hmm. he came to a net session um, about three years ago, probably to the day um, that when I came back from Dubai. And, um, yeah, clicked straight away. He was very shy at the time, just um, just really desperate for an opportunity and eager to showcase his skills. But, um no, I knew I'd click with him before. We knew the same similar people, obviously um, similar cricket backgrounds, school wise. So, yeah, it was definitely like I think the first time I called him, I was a bit nervous and I didn't know what it was going to be like. Um, but I, I think as soon as I met him, I just knew that we'd get on. Um, same as Gilly, actually, um, mm-hmm. we got on pretty well. It was probably those those two ones that I clicked straight away. Nice, yeah. And do you remember seeing him bat for the first time as well? What what, what was that like? Because I, I mean, I feel like I was trying to think what it is about your batting that stands out so much, basically, because uh, there's something about the follow through sometimes. There's like not a thought that you're going to go for a run, basically. It's just like you hold the pose, you know it's gone for four. And then sometimes the off drives are a bit Damien Martin. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like there's no follow through there at all. It's just like a push. But it goes away. Did that, did that come through straight away, or was he trying to be good in his first net session, sort of blocking away? You know, there's two moments where I run, like struck a call. I mean, the first time it was in Polo Farm, just down the road, um, in the indoors there, and it struck me how well he played spin, and he hadn't, he didn't have much um, experience, even though he's played really high level at youth cricket. But so I remember Sam Billings, obviously captain, was like, "Geez, Tawanda, like you play spin, like." a pro um that was serious so that struck out but i didn't really look too much into it, indoor batting um but the one time that really stood out for me was played a second team game with him the first team had a week off um and we were preparing for the blast tournament um and yeah just watching him bat i think he hit aaron beard at south end over cover off the back foot like into the clubhouse which was 30 meters past the boundary and i was just like who the heck is this guy <laughs> like that is an unbelievable shot. And I was in serious form and I, there's no chance I could play that shot. And this guy's never played a professional game. And I just thought, wow, he's going to go to the top. And it's cool to see his journey so far, but a long way to obviously go. Yeah. So is, is that where it ends up, you think, like at the at the top level? And, and if you if you don't mind saying, what, what, what are the things that Twan needs to work on to, to get there, do you think? Um, obviously, I wouldn't fully know because I haven't made it myself. Um, but... Look, he needs to keep scoring runs. They rate him very highly at the England level. Um, I know Zach's a massive admirer of his game. Who knows? Hopefully Zach's a captain in the future. Um, but yeah, I think he needs to keep scoring runs, keep doing his thing. Like he's already got the flair there. He already works hard. He's just an extremely hard worker. So there's not much more. He just needs to keep learning the game. He's only two proper years into it and um, he's got a long way to go. But the sky's the limit. Probably not run people out. <laughs> Probably one of the work ons. For, for who? For me. Oh, I right. ran Jack leaning out twice last year. So that's yeah. a big work. Nah, on. that is one thing. Yeah. And I said it to you. Like you can get you can get in a mode and like sometimes you don't just like, breathe. Yeah. I don't see yeah. You yeah. just and that what well, that's what makes you good, but sometimes just it's know that, at the yeah. other end, like you said who you're dealing with, stuff like that. And that that's what I mean about the experience. And I was like that at your age where you yeah. You kind of just get I in remember, the zone. Like, yeah, I yeah. remember getting hit on the head first ball. I was about 20 and Rob Key was at the other end. I got like 20 odd runs, but I was like a zombie for the rest of the innings the next mm-hmm. hour. Then got in the changing room with Keys. He's like, you right, mate? Like, you, everything all right? And I was just like, yeah, I was just stuck in my own bubble. Um, and yeah, you can do that as a young player. Like, you're quite nervous, eager to do well, but... No, the real Tawanda's coming out and um, I'm sure you're going to have an even better season this year. Mm-hmm. And was that century, did it feel like something off your back or did you feel like you were kind of already 
at home or did you feel like you needed to show to other people that you had kind of belonged even though you were yourself at that level or what do you think i think it was more of a personal thing like i think people like i got opportunity at kent like obviously off the back of second team runs so like i think obviously the coaches thought i was good but like i think to prove to myself that i could cut it at this level i mean i had a couple starts like i'll get a 40 there 50 there 60 there and never really like a big one i think so for, for me it was just kind of like i can bat for long i can score big runs so it's more of like a, a personal thing i guess um for me um so hopefully i can build on that because obviously like i haven't really achieved much in the game and obviously i have to keep improving every season and keep evolving as a player so i think that's the biggest thing is to just probably back that up probably fivefold this year maybe and you mentioned talking to him when uh when you joined Kent, what 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 was it that pulled you to Kent? Because you would have off offers from a few places, I guess. Well, I don't know. I probably don't want to dive into it too much, but um, it was more a lot of background stuff that Paul Downton especially had to go through. Um, and obviously, like people like James Treadwell and Rob Furley kind of got my name um, at Kent, and Paul Downton probably did the hard yards like behind the scenes. Um, there's a lot of things that I obviously can't speak about, but um, he did a lot of work and. He's one of the, the best people I've probably ever met in my life. Um, to meet, well, to pretty much watch me play cricket once, never ever met me, didn't know who I was as a person. And for him to just be like, you know what, you'll, be, you'll, you'll fit right in at Kent and it doesn't matter what we have to go through, but you're going to be a Kent player. Like for me, that was the biggest thing. And obviously there's other offers, maybe more money on the table from other places. But I think as a person who, who grew up with... The, like a lot of values in Zimbabwe with my parents and stuff. I think I couldn't look past that and go anywhere else. Like, I think for me, I would have let myself down and I wouldn't have been comfortable going somewhere else after all of that effort, I think. Um, so yeah, that was the biggest thing. Ken, it's, it's, it's quite a special place really, isn't it? I mean, you get, a, a, thinking about Rob Keyes, now the MD of England cricket, who stayed at Kent his whole career and has sometimes said that, yeah, he might have achieved more in the game if he'd gone, gone away from Kent, but he took on so much with the captaincy and he suddenly, I think he might've said that that knocked five or 10 points off his bang average at times. Um, you're now captain at Kent and Kent is obviously a very different place to what it was then, but it must just be such a proud moment for you to have come in, what were you seven when you first came into the club to now be captain 23 years later? Yeah, it's a really proud feeling, um, especially for the family as well. My dad driving me around the country everywhere to Kent games. Um, so being able to lead the club out is is an honour really. And uh, yeah, the times have changed a lot since Rob Key was captain. When I started, he was coming to the back end of his career. I caught sort of the last four or five years of him playing. And uh, it's a very different place. There's a lot more sort of things in structure that will help us be more efficient. Um, and that couldn't be helped, obviously, as things progress, you get better with time. But um, yeah, I'd like to think that if everyone does their jobs, things will be run efficiently. And um, and yeah, I can keep those five, 10 points in my bat and average that <laughs> Keezy loss. Because I, I don't disagree with him. The stress, the stressful times he probably went through, um, especially at the back end of his career, um, dealing with a few things can't have been easy. And, um, and yeah, hopefully we're moving in the right direction. Well, we definitely have been and hopefully we can continue to move in the right direction. You're Kent's first captain of, of Caribbean descent. Um, and I was, uh, obviously black cricketers are underrepresented in county cricket, which means that black captains are as well, I suppose. I was reading an interview that we did with, um, with Mark Elaine at Gloucestershire and talking about how, uh, the quote you said was that he, he felt he needed to get a stage perform and then inspire other guys to stay in the game. Obviously you're just Kent captain. Your job is just to, you know, win games of cricket, but do you feel that you are a role model in that sense or that you have does does that come into your thinking at all or not really uh a little bit not when i'm got the kent shirt on and mm -hmm. in the change room um yeah my main focus is just to do well and help kent win games of cricket but yeah there's no getting away from it um i know i know little parts of the impact that it has especially where i'm from and uh yeah it's a big deal but at the end of the day like i've been at kent since i was seven and come through the system and um and like to think I deserve the opportunity and and yeah no doubt I hope hopefully I'll make people proud along the way but yeah for sure when I was growing up I looked at um a lot of sort of Caribbean or black cricketers black sportsmen and um was was in awe of them because they were like me and uh hope if I can 
ever help the next generation to feel like that then 100 percent i'll take that on board but yeah I, it's two different things isn't it when i'm on the pitch just full focus on getting the results yeah um and i want to talk a bit about your both your roots into the game in terms of the the private school system as well because i know you've spoken about it before the how necessary that that scholarship was and now how you know when you walk around is it catford that you're from yeah i, I used to live in catford yeah uh, yeah the, the muse are great uh, but, um, <laughs> yeah. uh talent is the main thing that gets you in there but you need those opportunities as well and is, is there more that that kent can do and that english cricket can do to sort of get into those areas i guess south london in particular i suppose feels underrepresented in the professional game yeah there's a lot of different dynamics i think look the ecb especially in the last sort of four years have been onto it uh kent have been onto it as well a heck of a lot um if anything i've it's been the opposite i've tried to kind of focus on my cricket because there's so much going on in that regard and uh, as a late 20s year old trying to focus on your cricket um you just i just want my head to be clear but definitely i think the ecb i'm not entirely sure about everything but they're they're doing a lot of work and and south london is very underrepresented i think there's so many people there and um and those four boroughs in London are part of Kent. And I think with the growth of Beckenham and the clubs, I think that's part of the whole process to uh, to really tap into that um, to that side of Kent, that part of London. And it's not just uh, black kids, it's everyone. It's There's so many sort of white people or um, Asian people in that area um, who are also underrepresented. So um, yeah, I think that it's definitely needed and the ECB rightly so uh, are making strides towards getting there. Mm. Um, and is it something that's talked about in dressing rooms much at all? Or do you think is it something that is, again, is it is it mostly cricket and, and what do you think? Uh, I think it is spoken a little bit about. I, that's the beauty of our changing room is there's many people from many different backgrounds um, and that it's amazing, I think. We sort of counted like 12 different nationalities of heritage in the change room. So, yeah, it'd be stupid if it wasn't a part of discussions. But um, no, I think we've got a really understanding squad from what I've seen. And uh, and that's what, make, that's what makes us gel together is accepting each other's differences and where we've come from and embracing it, but creating our own kind of story. I had one that was a, a, a bit cheeky. I don't know if you know the guys that seen the guys at Caribbean Cricket Podcast yeah uh, they have a little hobby where they talk <laughs> about like people who they think could be sort of hooked into West Indies if they get a chance and they, they often talk him about, about you <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Lord, <laughs> nah. <laughs> nah. Uh, has anyone ever had a conversation with you from West Indies Cricket or is it just nah, not officially not officially um, my parents are Jamaican so mm -hmm. my dad I think would be so proud but nah like I'm English right so well British so, um, <laughs> so and look I've played I've born here but I played England 15s 19s England Lions um so it look I'd love the West Indies I grew up supporting them as well as England but um yeah it hasn't really crossed my mind but look I you can never say never weirder things have happened but um in terms of them approaching me not not particularly Jimmy Adams I know very well used to coach at Kent um, and to be honest, reading between the lines, I think he's kind of keen for me to just do my thing here and um, having coached Ken. I don't know why I haven't delved into it, but I think he reckons you're British, keep scoring runs and um, keep doing your thing. And hopefully an England cap, you never know, may come. It's getting more and more unlikely. But I know Joe Denley had a second stint at England when he was 32, 33 after a year like I had last year. So... If I can try and back that up, England's goal. But I, yeah, in a in another world, I would definitely that would be a cool thing to play for West Indies. Can't really ask you the the same question exactly because it's just uh, such an odd situation you're in. But I guess it, everything is kind of off the table for however long it takes. You just got to score runs. A lot of cricketers get elevated before their time, perhaps, or if they're not elevated, then they're being talked about. And for you, you can just focus on it for however long until that qualification comes. I guess. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's just, again, focusing on being at Kent um, and, yeah, pretty much scoring runs every single year until that time comes. But I think for me, <clears throat> it's just making sure that my game's in order. And if that time does come and I get lucky and I'm blessed enough to do that, but for now, I just have to focus on scoring runs at Kent um, and then focus on, yeah, the here and now. And then whatever happens in the future happens. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I feel like you can just get caught up in thinking about things like that. So 
just put it at the back of my mind and then just try to score runs, yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to talk just a bit more generally about county cricket, I guess. Because uh, you mentioned earlier about the the schedule and how you felt Zonk to come into that uh, that game against North Ants. And the, the blast schedule in particular this year, I think, I can't remember which, which weekend it is, but there's one two-day thing where Kent play, I think, a Friday night and then a Saturday lunchtime, I think. Uh, like, how, how do you deal with that as a professional cricketer? And, and how much... Is, is there anything you can do to sort of say to someone like, you know, we want this to change or do you have to kind of take what you're given kind of thing? Yeah, it's nuts, to be honest. Um, we have PCA meetings and um, they give us an air, really. They give us the mic to sort of voice our opinions. But a lot of these decisions are made for different reasons. Obviously, the people paying our wages, they want to see us playing when they want that. So I get that. Um, and also the, the English summer is not, the longest summer mm-hmm. so there's so much cricket to fit in um but it's a difficult one it, it does get dangerous there were points last year where it was so dangerous I remember um well part of the reason was because I got 300 that's not a schedule thing but just being so tired at the end of that knock and then coming here to play against um Sussex and I remember it was under lights and I got injured that day because of the schedule really but I remember Tamal Mills bowling and I was half awake, 5,000 in the crowd. And I just thought, this isn't right. Like I could get hit here or something could happen here. Luckily it was my hamstring, but I generally didn't feel right that whole day um, because of lack of sleep, coming back late at night um, and obviously just playing relentless cricket in the height of the summer. But hopefully something can be done. I think the bigger counties find it a lot easier just to rotate players um, at Kent, smaller county, we play all form, so it's a bit more tricky. But yeah, something does need to be done because the safety of players is at times um, a big, a big issue. Mm-hmm. And how, how do you find it actually, as a younger player? Because I guess someone who's like fully established and a senior player, they might be able to put their hand up and say, "I'm exhausted. I need a rest." I don't know if you just want, if you feel like you need to just play every game you get picked for, or if you feel you can do that. And also, how how has that affected you? so far going through do you think? I think I don't know in like the situation I was in last year like not being in the first team at the start um, like I was just happy to play any game whatever game and just play as many games as I can for Kent and score as many runs as I can so I mean obviously it, it does um, affect you in some ways but like I think as a young person like you just want to crack on and just have fun like playing under lights at the Oval or like playing at Gloucester playing at Lord's um, you just crack on really and just have fun and just bring energy to the team because um, we're the young ones so have a couple red balls and get going <laughs> yeah, so, yeah 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 and I guess because the other thing as well is that like from a professional cricket point of view the reason why the schedule is squeezed is kind of exciting right like the hundred is is it is a new shiny thing and it's an opportunity to, to earn money and to play on a big stage as well so it is tricky to get the balance because part of the reason is to try and put English cricket onto a new stage I guess yeah it's a really good point and I've always thought that look I don't I completely get why the struggles there because even at the PCA meetings everyone has a different idea and a lot of people think four day cricket is the key and and you need to be playing that in June July and then other people say you want the school kids to come in in their summer holidays so I really get it. Like I said, the summer is quite short in the UK. Um, but the one thing for me is just safety and uh, just making sure that players can give 100% for the crowd, for the public, and also they're protected as well. Because um, the last thing you want to see is a substandard sort of game because because players are tired or they're, they're waiting to, to play in the 100 the next week. So um, hopefully something can be done. But um, yeah, it's, it's always tricky. But... And I, I do like playing a lot of cricket. I'm, I'm a batter, so I want to play as much as possible. I look at Australian and New Zealand's New Zealand sort of domestic structures and a lot of their players, if you're a Red Bull player, you play like eight games a year. That's mm-hmm. nothing. So I, I completely get it. But um, yeah, like you said, going from a Friday night game to a Saturday midday game is just, yeah, it's not, it's not good. Um, moving on, next we have uh, my moment of the year um, in Winindu Hasaranga. You've gone early, yeah. So, nothing can beat this. Nothing's going to be this. So, listen carefully, because I reckon a lot of people have missed this. So, in the final Sri Lanka-Bangladesh ODI, Hasaranga gets done for 
and I quote, snatching his cap from one of the umpires and ridiculing the umpiring in the match. And given his previous, his, uh, the number of demerit points he had accrued, he was an absolute shoo-in for a ban. And not just any ban, a four-match T20i ban. Schranker's next four T20Is are the entirety of the T20 World Cup group stage, where two teams from each group qualify. They've got South Africa and Bangladesh, who are their arch rivals. So that ban would include a game that would, in all likelihood, be a playoff for the next round against arch rivals Bangladesh. So between the ODI and re- actually receiving the ban, Hasaranga was slyly included in the Sri Lanka squad for the Bangladesh tests. What's the issue, you might ask? Well, Hasaranga has been retired from test cricket for a year. And you'd think that if your star man goes back on a decision like that, there would be some sort of formal announcement from someone. But no, he was just added to the list of names. Then comes his ban. And now he's back as a test cricketer. He is instead banned for two test matches against Bangladesh rather than four T20 World Cup matches. Class. Had he played the tests, by the way, he would have missed the start of the IPL. And it's been reported that his franchise, Sunrisers Hyderabad, had no knowledge of Wanindu's uh, change of heart uh, over the Red Bull and subsequent IPL unavailability. We know how it looks, said Ajantha Mendis, who sits on the Sri Lanka <laughs> Selection <laughs> Committee. If it looks iffy <laughs> and it sounds iffy, it probably is. <laughs> but he did, he did, he did. Um, stressed that this decision was taken well before that final ODI. Sure. Uh, the ICC have the power to ban him for those T20I games rather than the tests. Um, their code of conduct allows the discretion to be used in decreeing uh, from what format a player is banned. Clause 7.93 states, the ICC shall apply the suspension point to the subsequent international matches in which the player is most likely to participate in. At the time of recording, he is currently banned from the tests rather than the T20 World Cup. I think that's just, uh, that's absolutely brilliant. Um, if you're Bangladesh, surely you're, you're writing letters at this point. Surely you're writing mm-hmm. letters. Um, <laughs> I'm not sensing the same enthusiasm. And they hate each other as well, Yeah, they absolutely hate each other. No, it's a super, I think we need a sort of a five-part pod special of behind the scenes who came up with the idea. I've got some... Some th- you know, were they sat there thinking, can we organise four T twenty eyes against yeah, the yeah, smallest yeah, possible yeah. nation? We'll invite them over for four games, and then someone sat there and thought, like, oh, I would just unretire from the test. <laughs> but yeah, Sri Lanka have previous as well because they they I don't know whether you remember this, but there was a sneaky captaincy change once where I think I think it was this way round where uh, Mahela was captain and was a game away from a ban if there was an overrate problem. So he just gave the captaincy to Sangakara <laughs> for one game. <laughs> unannounced you know just turned up at the toss he captained while Sanger was uh, yeah you know officially doing it um avoided the ban the period elapsed and then suddenly yeah. switched back to my Haley captain for the next game so they, they clearly you know there's there, there must be something going on so there must be someone in the in the back room someone upstairs that old old guy in the cupboard who no one knows what his job is <laughs> turns out he's yeah. uh, just head of skullduggery sounds like the genius we need to sort of take control of all of cricket scheduling problems yeah, exactly. um a slight change of um of mode um elsewhere this week australia have pulled out of an upcoming series against afghanistan a cricket australia statement read following consultation with the australian government cricket australia previously postponed the odi series against afghanistan scheduled for march 2023 after a mark deterioration in human rights for women and girls in afghanistan Over the past 12 months, Cricket Australia has continued to consult with the Australian government on the situation in Afghanistan. The government's advice is that conditions for women and girls in Afghanistan are getting worse. For this reason, we have maintained our previous position and will postpone the bilateral series against Afghanistan. Uh, Some people have pointed out that Australia, um, in between the two postponements, um, still uh, still played Afghanistan at the World Cup. Um, we had a question on this from an Ireland fan, which I think is really good. So this is from Patrick. I'm interested to hear your thoughts on Australia declining to play Afghanistan again. As an Irish fan, I've been following the recent series that's been hosted in the UAE, UAE between us and Afghanistan. Although it was jarring to see the tour at times being used as an extended visit Afghanistan advert, a country where women would not be welcome given the country's political stance, nobody was actually watching the games given the plethora of franchise cricket on at the moment. 
And playing these games is what we need to survive on as a small nation crying out for opportunities to play competitive cricket. The pictures of the dignitaries box being full of men led to lots of laughter between my wife and I about how unashamed they were about the optics. It's obvious to me, at least, that the ICC should ban Afghanistan and withhold funding given that they are not fulfilling their obligations to being a full member. But in the meantime, we're left to deal with boards making their own decisions. After watching that series, I can't help but feel that the more powerful thing for Australia to do is actually play the series and shine a light on what is happening. Right now, we have an amazing statement from the Afghanistan Cricket Board suggesting cricket should not have political influences, which seems a bit rich, given what I've watched and heard over the past few weeks. Um, yeah, it's quite a, a nuanced take from, from Patrick. It's um, an excellent email. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you have initial uh, thoughts on the situation? Uh I think it's it's an interesting solution that he comes up with that perhaps playing the games and using them to to spotlight the hypocrisies that are taking place, um, not not least from the ICC themselves, hmm. uh, has some merit. But you worry that that message would get smudged, it would get lost, um, and you know, certain sort of stakeholders from the Afghanistan side would end up muscling in and then it would become a kind of slightly mm. sanitized version and the players would kind of be asked about it until they're blue in the face and they'd, they'd end up just playing the series anyway, perhaps. And, but and, my, bi my, and bilateral my, series as well uh, quite often don't get that much yeah. um, attention sure. these days. Um, I, I, I've got really mixed feelings on this. Um he mentioned the Ireland Afghanistan series and mm. I, we watched the, the finale of the, the test match. Mm. And although it was eccentric, uh, played at the tolerance oval because there was a sports sports, sports day, day yeah. for a local school on the big pitch. Nonetheless, it had, there was something really quite magical about it. And the idea that you are bl blocking Af young male Afghanistan, Af Afghanistani cricketers from, from fulfilling their dreams jars with me but the the moral case is is overwhelming i think the more i think about it and the more i read about it as well um for context and we've spoken about this on the show before but a large majority of afghanistan's female cricket team had to flee the country lest terrible things would happen to them and their families that's that that's what was at stake they are now as, as people know you know exiled predominantly in Australia. Um, and while it, it really breaks your heart to think about these cricketers that are being prevented from playing, um, and you, there's an element for me that, that wants to maintain the chances of, of their male counterparts playing because it keeps the issues in the public eye and these conversations keep being had. Uh, nonetheless, the more I think about it, the more I can't countenance it. I just can't. And if the ICC had any true guts, then they wouldn't kowtow to influential, powerful figures um, and instead pretend that everything's okay in the garden um, and let's not ruffle any feathers, thanks very much. Uh, they've refused to take action and refused to even call out the... The, the horrors that these that these women have, have, have experienced. Um, and so there's a kind of like a, a murder of, of sort of smug silence. Mm. Uh, and I keep coming back to this line that Katia, Katia wrote in the magazine a, f a few months ago. Um, and I just pulled it up just now. You, you, can't, you cannot celebrate the success of the women's game in some parts of the world while ignoring their oppression in others. If you don't care about all of us, then you care about none of us. You know, and that's, it's hard to refute, mm. I think. And I, as I've, I've gone back and forth on this issue. But uh, again, another, another line that really stuck with me when I was thinking about this yesterday. Uh, we ran a brilliant tribute to Mike Proctor in the magazine. And uh, the obvious comparison, the obvious parallel is apartheid Af South Africa, where they didn't play for 22 years. Uh, and Mike Proctor, who's a great, bear of a man, real humane bloke as well, liberal-minded, progressive, and an all-time great cricketer. And he said, uh, 
if sacrificing his international career helped in any way at all to dis dismantle and destroy that horrifying state of affairs in South Africa, then it was worth it. Mm. Um, the specific quote is, if, if, I lost, if, if a lost test career played even the smallest part in the ending of apartheid, it was a price worth paying. And it feels like that kind of moral clarity is so lacking at the moment in this issue. Uh, I think ultimately I'm, I'm behind Australia's stance here, however heartbreaking it is for entirely innocent young, young people you know, whose, whose dreams are being wrenched away from them. I, I suppose this, this is quite an unusual situation in terms of a sporting context because of the fact that um, cricket is by a distance the main sport in Afghanistan and cricket is quite good generally at slipping in behind other sports and sort of, mm. you know, if, if this was if this was another country which also played football, which also had the, you know, had participation in the Olympics and stuff like that, and there was an obvious answer that seemed like it was a collective solution across sport, I think cricket would go straight into the slipstream and say, we'll do what they're doing. But this is a, it feels like a classic example to me of, of cricket having to come up with a solution itself and, and basically demurring on it, which is what's happened in most cricket governance globally mm. for the past, you know, not just 20 years beyond that. Um, there was a really, really good interview at the end of last year, I think around the time that Australia were due to play Afghanistan in the World Cup, um, which they obviously went ahead with and they made a, you know, slightly, you know, corporately worded statement about why that was somehow different to the bilateral series and saying that one was um, un directly under their jurisdiction versus the ICC's jurisdiction. Um, but that, that's, Alice, that's, Alice, where, that's where their position becomes flakier. Yeah. But, and but there, there is precedent of stepping away from... Yeah. Um, in, in world tournaments, big, yeah. big time yeah. world, world Cup games, and of course England in '03 under Nasser Hussein famously yeah. did so. So mm. there, there is precedent for this. Mm. But there was a really good interview. It was Alison Mitchell speaking to Jeff Allardyce, the chief executive of the ICC, and just very much exposed the the, the flaws in his argument. It's worth digging out mm. um, rather than me, you know, rehashing it and getting the details wrong. But it, it, it's yeah, it's worth listening to, and I think. Um, will give you if if listeners are sort of looking for a bit more clarity on the issue. I tell you what, what, what it is, they don't interview. know. They yeah, they yeah. do not know. And I've mm. I spoke to to Wazin Khan, you know, estimable, estimable bloke, you know, general cricket manager at the ICC, and he didn't really have any kind of sort of clarity either in his answer. And and it's almost like they're sort of willfully muddying the waters here mm. and and hoping people don't hoping that the big full members pull into line uh, and and don't do what Australia have done here mm. and don't bring the issue back into the public realm. Well, it needs to be. It needs to be, I think. Overall, that's the, that's the side that I've come down on with this. But mm. I do it with a heavy heart because I absolutely understand that the, the, the idea that it's better to play the games and keep these issues being discussed. Mm. Whereas I don't, think, I don't think England have had any... FTP commitments against Afghanistan and that almost feels like a, a dodging of the issue in itself by not having the fixture schedule they don't have to make a difficult decision they play them at the World Cup fine and that's it and I don't think we've heard anything from ECB publicly about it mm. I can't think of anything off the top of my head maybe I you know, apologise if I've missed something but I don't think anyone at the ECB as far as I'm aware has, has addressed it publicly at mm. all and that, that feels like a yeah almost a much easier yeah. response than Australia who at least have had the games there and have you know made made a have have taken some kind of stand at least it'll be interesting to see um what the scrutiny around this will be at the T20 World Cup the quite a short gap between major tournaments and with Australia putting out now it feels like the the, the conversation has enough momentum to 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 keep going for for the World Cup the, um, the ICC are, are in a shocking position on this you know. Well, it's just inconsistent, right? It's, they, it's they, they, they have, it's, it's they their, have their own, own constitution. Gone. Exactly. It's exactly. their own constitution yeah. that is being undermined uh, and they have no no moral courage to mm. confront it. It just, it's very, you know, the ICC by pretty much by its own admission is basically an events management company mm. and it, it just it, yeah it's a it's <laughs> soprano a, style it's a it's a group Waste of management <laughs> it's a group of all these people that are all these boards that are club together you know cricket australia have the power to address this yeah at icc level um they're a big player in the icc mm. so are the ecb so the bcci everyone has the power to do something about it but yeah. it's easier not to find a collective solution and mm. let uh, people get criticised for decisions that they make independently, mm. rather than and just just let things 
play out mm. from their point of view. And yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty depressing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, On a lighter note, I'm yeah. going to do it now. The Passage Sports Quiz. Cool. Next week. What are you doing next week? Next Wednesday evening, Matt? You're getting a team together. Good lad. <laughs> Maximum of six sports quiz in Walthamstow in North, North East London. It's at a big boozer called the Big Penny Social in East 17. Um, and it's in aid of the Passage Homelessness Charity uh, based in Victoria, just up the road from where we are. It's, it's become our official charity partner. We've hosted podcasts there in the past and so on and so on. They do incredible work and it's their first big sports quiz fundraiser mm. next week. 25 quid ahead, but you get a free drink, you get entry into the quiz and win some magnificent prizes, blah, 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 blah. I'm writing the questions. Oh. And also, you know, all, all of the stars of the show will be there, apart from Katya, who's on the graveyard shift that night. But you'll be there, Yaz, with a team. No, you will be there. You've said you'll be there. I actually haven't said that. I thumbs <laughs> you up are joking and, I thumbs me. up the message. I, you I are joking I me. I, I have a legitimate excuse. You are jo- You're serious? I am, I am serious, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? Uh, a, a friend who lives abroad is, is, is visiting the we UK. Come, come along. It's not really his thing. Oh, this is shocking. <laughs> but you're there. You're there. You're, you're writing the questions. Uh, Ben's going to be there. Uh, Matt's going to be there. Yeah. Um, oh, it's really not the stuffing out of me. <laughs> anyway, look, whatever. <laughs> Passage. Dot... No, okay. <laughs> Passage.org.uk forward slash sports hyphen quiz. Passage.org.uk forward slash sports dash quiz. Please, please, please enter your teams come along if you're just on your own but you fancy it we'll find a team for you it's all the fun of the fair please please come along don't be yes be more me don't be like yes we'll leave a link to the event in the description unbelievable uh, a question from tom and it's next week it's next wednesday right so you've got to get it done quickly uh we've got a question from tom unbelievable um, how do you make the county championship more popular for young people uh love the podcast love the magazine i'm a 22 year old hampshire member While many are getting hyped for the IPL, I'm buzzing for the start of the county championship. Firstly, I've got to credit Hampshire for their affordable young person membership. Just 59 quid for all county championship, one day cup and T20 matches. However, I'm often the youngest person at the ground on a county championship match day. It still seems that young people are constantly told by senior people in cricket that long term long form cricket isn't for us and our attention spans are too short and the only thing pushed onto us through marketing is short form cricket. Personally, I think this is a self-fulfilling prophecy that the powers that be have resigned themselves to. At the members forum last season, Rod Bransgrove effectively said young people don't care about long form cricket. Um, Perhaps I'm too idealistic, but there's got to be some potential in a competition that provides competitive sport, top overseas players and a chance to watch England stars up close. What can be done to make the championship more attractive to younger fans one idea i've got is to give out free championship tickets with every hundred ticket that's sold um matt you're young um how how can we get young people uh to 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 watch the championship i I think um well we were saying i doesn't like it i don't know why you're asking (laughs) (laughs) yeah what you do is you buy them all the sky (laughs) subscription and get them sat down at 3 p.m in front of the IPL. um no we we were talking about this briefly off air and sort of uh, spitballing around free tickets and um, I suppose the, the the trouble potentially with giving away tickets for free um, is the implication that the product isn't worth anything and possibly as well the fact that while uh, county championship match day revenue isn't going to move the needle at all in terms of the county's finances, um, county memberships might and county members might be much less likely to renew if they think that they're getting mugged by uh, paying their, I don't know, 250 quid, let's say, mm. per year at a certain county um to get a product that a lot of people are also getting for free um so i think that is a a tricky thing i think also the the fundamental truth is that county championship cricket goes on for long periods of time Mm. and most people don't have enough time to uh, sort of dedicate to to um to it Mm. because you know this this year they've made a, a good change in that the early rounds of the season are running friday saturday sunday monday which means that there is a lot of weekend cricket um and i th- i think that is a a good move um it's going to get through people through the gates in a way that you know there, there have been previous seasons where it's gone monday to thursday which obviously isn't going to work in terms of spectators good for the working week though yeah very very good for cricket journalists <laughs> very bad for cricket fans 
um but yeah it's um my my take is that it's 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 probably about doing small things locally like um i'm sure i remember overhearing in the taunton press box at some point that there was some problem where they could no longer get people in for free after tea um that might have been a, a one-off thing i, yeah. I don't want to um get angry emails from from somerset fans but um i think that you know st- stuff like that is is pretty important where you you get people through the gates for the final session for free or for two quid or whatever it is um and just give people a bit of exposure yeah. to it and the op- and and yeah the opportunities to stumble across something that they you know end up loving in the way that the three of us do mm. i think i think the marketing around the county championship reflects the audience they've already got rather than the audience they, they want to have or should want to have. I think um, you've got, when you've got, you know, say you use, um, you know, the, the, the blast things on, but if you've got 20,000 people in or 5,000 people at a smaller ground packed house, you should be using the, the breaks to really plug that it's the same people playing the four day stuff. And I just don't buy the idea that it's just, is an inherently unpopular competition because the standard of cricket often is, is incredibly high and test cricket is so popular in this country. People pay a lot of money to watch test cricket and you've got uh, for a fraction of the price, still a very high standard of, of Red Bull cricket, not test cricket, sure, but you know, you've got uh, a lot of, of really, really brilliant test players who are regulars in the championship. It doesn't make sense to me that it is, is as poorly attended occasionally as it has been. Um, so I think need to go all out. And also I think, especially with the opportunity of streaming, um, it's very easy to watch um, Red Bull cricket nowadays. I think some streams could make more, an eff- more of an effort to make it look fun. I think um, it sometimes that the, the tone isn't that exciting. You, I think they've constantly got to think, if you're someone watching this for the first time, how welcoming is this to a new 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 fan? You know, a, a 12-year-old in on a summer holiday day, just wax on YouTube, it's recommended. What does this look like? Um, I think the the, the 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 energy behind it is is sometimes um, quite uh, exclusive rather than inclusive. I think it, it it's it's very much targeted to the people who already like it rather than new people. Um, is my is my yeah. view. Yeah, I think if if money wasn't an issue, and you know, just stop this there because yeah. it always is. Yeah. But if it wasn't, if it was a clean slate, if it was limitless pockets, then you'd play, I'd want to see it being played at five different grounds in, in that county. You know, I take my, my club Essex, you know, they don't, they never play anymore. South End, Colchester, mm. Ilford. They always used to play at those places. It was, it was a part of a, of a summer that doesn't happen anymore. Mm. Surrey play one game, one championship game at Guildford. Um, in fact, I don't think they played a championship game at Guildford last year. They just played a couple of 50 over games. They used to play there. They used to play at Whitgift uh, and so on and so on. I think you'd, there's always more of an event around it. And it's all, and the optics are much more appealing as well when you play at smaller grounds. Mm. Uh, we do stuff here. And the Oval, while its history is, is, speaks for itself, it's cavernous and, it's, and it feels hauntingly empty, even though they, they get good numbers. They get mm. three, four, four thousand in for a good championship game. But it still feels empty. Um, bringing in local schools, local communities, local kids is, is obviously a no-brainer. And I don't care if it's free. Uh, and I don't care if it puts a few members' noses out of joint. The bigger picture is, is, is so much more important. Mm. Um, make the players a bit more accessible as well. Uh, to, to young, impressionable people coming through the doors. They might just see it as a, as a day off, an afternoon off school. But, you know, if you can feel like you can touch the players, communicate with the mm. players. And that, that has, a, has a, a massive impact as well. When I was a kid, I remember that at Chelmsford, that you could literally touch Gooch as he walked down the steps and you could feel it. You could feel the, the intimacy of it yeah. all. That sounds slightly That's weird actually- when I say that, <laughs> but you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, and and if, if you're playing at Trent Bridge or Edgbaston or the Oval, you don't get that kind of, that community mm. sense too much. I totally agree with you on the streams, but then five years ago, we didn't have any. So there's definite progress there, definite progress in the scheduling across weekends. That all helps. Uh, but there's also something just innate about it. Let's be honest. There's something innately unusual about it. It doesn't fit into any other sporting experience mm. that's that's available to, to people. And you either get it or you don't. And, and it remains yeah. unfathomable to those who don't. 
as it stands. You know, I've loved it since I, literally since I was six years old. But that's that's me. And as I said before, we started recording as well. Um, we we are the wrong people to ask that question too because <laughs> we've we, we've we've we fell for it as as, as kids. Um, next up, a chat with uh, Wizard India's Sara Waris, who was at the WPL final. Uh, the WPL um, was, uh, by most accounts, a, a success this year, and it was capped off by RCB, as we talked about earlier, uh, one of the main, most popular, if not the most popular franchise in India, winning its first ever piece of silverware. So here's Sara on the WPL. We're joined now by Wiz and India's Sara Waris, who's at the WPL final. Sara, watching the final unfold from the UK, um, the atmosphere just looked incredible. And then watching uh, what followed afterwards, the guard of honour RCB got from the men's side uh, in front of a massive crowd as well. Um, the whole atmosphere around the final stages of the WPL was amazing. Uh, was that the, the sense that you got from, from being in the ground? Definitely I did. What made it even more surreal was it was uh, actually a home game for Delhi Capitals, which were one of the teams in the finalists. But 90% of the fans were supporting RCB. I did manage to speak to a few fans who were supporting RCB. They said they were from Delhi, which made it even more strange that they were supporting RCB. And almost all of them said they are there for just Virat Kohli, you know, just as a tribute for his loyalty, playing for the same team for 16 years. And they're just there for him, no matter which team RCB brings up next, they'll be there supporting them. So the atmosphere was amazing. They were distributing flags, like the Delhi teams probably knew that they'd have half the support the RCB were getting. So they distributed uh, flags for free, but the RCB chance, like there was... Uh, no topping that. It was a surreal experience. And to be there, seeing an RCB team after 17 years, seeing all the meltdown of the fans of <laughs> oh, previously, it was a amazing atmosphere. And just the scenes that followed, there were videos of uh, Bangalore, late 2 a.m., 3 a.m., just out on the street, supporting, cheering for RCB. And that just gives a hint of, you know, how solid their fan base is, despite them not winning a lot. And also uh, the fact that they were starved of wins over all these years and just the, the celebrations, the happiness. It was just uh, f phenomenal as, as a fan. Like I was supporting RCB, though I'm not an RCB supporter in the IPL, but I was supporting RCB, just wanted to be there to experience the atmosphere. It was amazing. Um, just to give a sense to a lot of people listening to this will be in the UK. How, how big are RCB in India, are they the most supported franchise? Would is, are they the sort of team that wherever you go in India, you're going to find RCB fans? Because that that was it, right? This is a huge moment. RCB, this massive franchise, have never won anything in the men's competition. So this is the first bit of silverware that they've ever got. Yeah, um, uh, worldwide, I think last year there was this uh, social media, um, the list, someone released the list where RCB had the most social media engagements along with, I think, Real Madrid and Barcelona. So they're not competing with just cricket teams now. Mm. They are among the top three and competing with the best football teams. I think RCB and CSK, both of them have loyal fan bases. I think because that's because of Dhoni and this is because of Kohli. So RCB versus Chin is actually called the El Clasico of the IPL. It's mm. that big. And RCB, so I have this one experience. I was watching a KKR match. I was in the hospitality box a few years ago where the cricketers' wives and all, they were uh, just behind me, sitting behind me. And I think uh, someone dropped Kohli. And uh, the entire stadium went, it was a KKR home game. Uh, it was at Eden Gardens. And the entire stadium just went up celebrating. Uh, the home team had dropped a catch of Virat Kohli, the opposition captain. Uh, and the entire stadium was celebrating the players' wives behind me. They were like, what is going on? This is ridiculous. <laughs> you know, you're not supporting the home team. So that, that's just a small gl a glimpse of what RCB is. No matter where you go, there are RCB, RCB chants. Uh, the first match of the WPL when Smriti Mandana was actually playing the first game, she was left in tears because of how loud the cheers were. Um, she was was like she was actually asking the crowds to you know silence down a yeah. bit so that was 
that's uh, just amazing to see and the fact that it has now gone on to the women's team it's not just limited to the men's team the women's team are getting that exact same support uh, led by the guard of honor it was um, it just shows that you know women uh, the fans here are willing to accept uh, women's cricket mm. and you just need to market it well you just need to have all the ingredients and they they will come and they will support the women's team on, on the final itself delhi got off to a, a pretty good start they got a gun top order and then sophie molyneux changed the game to three wickets in and over it was it was some spell from her and, and some collapse as well from, from delhi who, who look a very strong side on paper yeah they uh, and the all three shots they played were ridiculous sweeps which could have been avoided mm. and there's also a very interesting bit on Molyneux actually uh, so this was a player Smriti Mandana after RCB had a terrible season last year they started with five defeats uh, Smriti Mandana admitted that you know captaincy was getting to her and Molyneux was one player they shortlisted last year in June July itself the franchise told Mandana that this is your team now. No, how you want to run it, it's on you. The players you want, it's on you. So Molyneux had not played a T20I since 2021. But she was one player Mandana was certain she needed in the team. In the 100, I think, with Luke Williams. She was playing under Luke Williams. She was like, this is the coach I want. So both of them then got in touch with Molyneux, asked her what her progress was about her uh, with her injury. And uh, they kept in touch with her. And Mandana later said that she's actually uh, bold to her during the 2021 series. The way she bold to her, that was the difference. She was the difference between the two sides. Uh, I think India uh, went down 2-1. But it was a very close contested game. And uh, Mandana had said that Molni was the difference. And she faced a lot of trouble while facing her. Mm. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, on on the shots that led to the collapse, if uh, if if listeners haven't watched the collapse, uh, Alice Capsi's premeditated sweep brought memories of of, of Root's premeditated reverse ramp uh, from the from the Test series. Um, you touched on it earlier, but just overall, how 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 much of this interest is would you say is, is genuine interest in women's cricket, and how much of it is loyal support to the franchise? And how much is is following is, is one transferring to the other? Is interest in women's cricket growing because of the of the links with the men's competition? Do you think? I think it's a mix of both. Um, because women's cricket in general has been growing. Stadiums are getting f- uh, filled. It was twenty twenty two the India Australia series at Wankhede. It was almost full houses. Uh, the atmosphere was amazing. India defeated Australia. If I'm not wrong in that series, it was just brilliant. Um, so, uh, there has been a decent crowd, uh, for the test match at the Wanka Day too. There are a lot of promos and advertisements now, and there is a noticeable growth. Obviously, the presence of IPL teams does act as a catalyst, and, uh, the fan bases which are already present, it just brings them, uh, onto the game even more. It has definitely helped, but I would also say that the presence of IPL teams has played a part because in the first game as I said Mandana receiving the kind of support almost being uh, in tears at the support RCB were getting I don't think it would have been possible if it was just another team I went for the UP versus Gujarat uh, match both teams the only two teams which don't have a law which don't have IPL teams and the atmosphere was relatively dull compared to you know say a Mumbai Indians or RCB because their rival is all already built up. I think WPL has missed a trick in not having all five IPL teams in the first round at least because the craze we've seen for RCB, Mumbai and Delhi have been uh, really good. And, and do you think that the WPL um, will expand soon either in terms of number of matches played, number of teams involved and also the spread of venues? Last year it was just in one venue, this year predominantly in two. Do you think that it's the time. The time is now right to to spread it around the country more. Definitely, the BCCI has said though that for the first three uh, seasons, which meant last year, this year, and again next year, there'll be five teams, and then they look to expand. Probably there are reports coming in that they will they can get in more IPL teams, which I think is the right way to go in terms of expanding not only to different venues but also to uh, bring in different fan bases. Uh, also, BCCI is looking at home and uh, away format for 
probably could happen next year probably could happen in 2026 when there are more teams also uh, with the expansion bit what's also interesting is jemima who has played 220 games or 220 odd games she said this was the first time that she was playing in delhi uh, in the last 5 years india have played whatever home matches they've played they've just played in five cities uh so it was the first time they were actually playing in delhi in a long long time hmm. so both of them spoke about how it was dif- uh, how it was a challenge to adapt to the conditions but also i feel in the long term that will help indian cricket because you know just playing in different conditions and knowing what to do when will be a big uh, positive so about expansion they will expand to different cities but it's also about expanding to different fa- bringing more people in uh, expanding in terms of the fans that you create so i think the way is only up for the wpl and this season showed what it actually can achieve and with rcb winning it was just i think the perfect uh, success story mm. and overall with two years into the competition now should we view the wpl as a success you know has it has it sort of brought in the crowds um that it it was designed to is it getting the eyeballs in that it was designed to definitely i would say it's been a success viewership on tv on live streaming has always been like upwards of 50 lakhs per every game which is great um, in delhi i was in delhi i was there for the delhi games most of the games except the up gujarat game which i uh, said most of them had crowds of upwards of 22000 with the capacity being 36000 uh, the final saw around 29 or 30000 people attend so the craze is there definitely definitely there even the cab drivers while i was coming back they were interested in knowing what's going on what the match is about and whenever i would say okay rcb are playing their first reaction was okay how are rcb playing they don't care which player is there because at the uh, grassroots level still you know there is not that craze but uh, with rcb playing and with the big ipl teams playing they still get the interest in so i would say it's been a relative success and it's just um, onwards and upwards from here for the IPL bigger picture 10 years ago would you have imagined these sort of crowds for a domestic women's competition no way uh, i would not have um i think 2017 was the uh, the moment when india reached the fi- the final lost the mm. final that was i think the revolution which women's cricket needed after that the wpl has been a couple of years late uh, we have criticized the bcci for their attitude towards women's cricket you know for a, a year after covid they didn't play a single game and all but now that they are there the advertising is being done there could have been a lot more buzz about the uh, wpl in the capital which i didn't really uh, see away from the stadiums there weren't a lot of hoardings and all but overall the advertisement uh, like on geo regularly whenever you tune in the first ad is of um, the WPL and all so that is being done uh, i would never have expected the, this kind of craze 10 years ago no one would have i think the women player themselves wouldn't have ex- expected this it's very heartening to see and uh, yeah onwards and upwards as i said yeah it was a great tournament to watch um, and yeah can't wait can't wait for the next one in 2025 sara thanks for your time thank you next sure, up surely this mate of yours for next week right he, he, i'm sure he you know just come along for a drink the quiz will only go on for like an hour and a half or so he can come along you can meet some of your friends from work we'll be really nice to him i'll ask the question seriously I'll, though, I'll, i will ask the question have, and also the quiz is not really about sport it's a sports quiz but it's about <laughs> you know if you like, if you watch the simpsons if you've watched you know i've done the questions right You mentioned Maid yeah. Marian and her Merry Men is, is another quick Ace Ventura stuff like that. So it's it's not it's not about sport. Come on, bring him along. I I will ask. Question. Sorry, um, Phil. Next. Uh, ne- <laughs> um, Phil, we yeah. now have a live draw. Oh, we're doing it now. We're doing oh, it now. Superb. We're doing it now. Right. Uh, do, is, do you want to explain what's it? What's this it is for? Huge. So um, in the magazine, two magazines ago, we ran a question. to win a top of the range grade 1 willow salix bat that won the gear test that won the gear test yeah uh as you can imagine a work of art mm. uh and the question was which current england star has to date been sponsored by five different bat brands across his test career 
including two separate stints with Grey Nichols. All right? Now, the answer, of course, is Jonathan Bairstow. Mm. Uh, it's not Jimmy Anderson. And, and, quite and, a and few Matt's done some serious that research there. on that today to confirm that James Anderson's only and researched and researched again, and it's not Jimmy <laughs> Anderson. So I've still got a job. Anyway, we ran the question in the magazine and then ran it online as well. And we had, we had hundreds of entries. In hundred and something entries, let's be honest. It was a hundred and something <laughs> entries. <laughs> anyway, this the, morning, yeah. uh, I've written them all out. And this might play better on the YouTubes. Hold on. And I put them all in the famous wisdom biscuit tin. Yeah. That was a good right. evocative noise for podcast yeah. listeners. Yeah. Though. Yeah. And as you can see, a bit of ASMR. As you can see, <laughs> they're all in there, all folded up, all the names, all the correct yeah. answers are in there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you to everyone who entered and yeah. all that. Now, Matthew Roller, you're going to yep. pick the name. God, yeah. This, ba this, this bat is worth, hold on, your battery's low, but you're okay. This this bat is worth 600 and plenty. Mm. It's, a, it's a stunner and it's the best bat in this year's WCM gear tests. And someone's about go. to win it. Here you Incredible. Go. I'm give it one more shake. One more shake. All right. Put your hand in there. And... The winner is... Pick, pick up your microphone. And the winner is... Da, da, da. How did he do it the other day? Uh, this piece of paper is... I'm seeing Oliver Pimlot. Oliver, Oliver Pimlot, Pimlot it is. Oliver Pimlot. Congratulations, Congratulations uh, young man or old man. Who can say? Um, <laughs> yeah, so there we go. Oliver Pimlot, well played. We will get back to you personally on that. Mm. Uh, thank you, everyone, for playing along. Um, that was Excellent. great fun. But that was great fun. Um, some more fun coming our way. Uh, May the 9th, lock it in your diaries. We're doing another live show uh, in London, very near the Oval, but not in the Oval. Uh, tickets will go live at some point next week. We've got um, Butch is, is obviously going to be involved. Um, Phil's going to be involved. Um, the, the regular team. Well, I might will be, be busy, involved. actually. I might have, have a mate <laughs> the regular over. team will all be involved, and we uh, uh, should be announcing at least one, maybe even two special guests in the next week or so so get involved for that um jot it down in your diaries and to finish the show the answer to the trivia qu trivia question which was quite a long time ago so i'll, I'll remind you uh, <laughs> who is the first player english player to take a wicket or score a run in the ipl matt you thought you knew the answer oh morgan Dimi mascarenas the answer is dimitri oh. mascarenas who was the sole english participant in the 2008 ipl he made one appearance for champions Rajasthan, Rajasthan Royals. Matt, do you know who he got out? Uh, well, my fear when you asked the question was that it wasn't going to be Dimmy because he was going to have blanked in his only game. Okay. So I don't know who he got out. Um, uh, let's go with um, Pragan Odja. No, he got out A.B. de Villiers and wow. Dinesh Kartik in, wow. in that game. Yeah. <laughs> I've uh, so Morgan, his Morgan joined the year after. So so um, Tim Rigmore did a, a piece on this a few years ago. Of course he did. Um, so Mascarenas gets a call from Warren mm. saying, do you fancy it? Mascarenas says, yes. Hampshire, though, had just appointed Mascarenas as their full-time captain. Um, post Warren, presumably. Po po post Warren. And Mascarenas' contract was worth 100000 if he was there for the whole thing but they only let him go for two weeks so that he'd miss as little Hampshire cricket as possible. So if he had gone for the whole thing, he'd have made a hundred grand for a guy who was not an England regular. That was a lot of money that Hampshire did not allow him to go for. Uh, the centrally, times. centrally yeah, contracted times guys at the time weren't allowed to go. They all went for the first time in 2009. Uh, and even then, I don't think it actually played a very big role in that particular IPL campaign. Some amazing lineups from that tournament, by the way. So in one game, the Rajasthan Royals top seven was Cameron Akmal, Graham Smith, Yusuf Bhattan, Shane Watson, Mohammed Kaif, a teenage Ravindra Jadeja, and Warney in at seven. Amazing. Super beautiful. Amazing. Different times. Cameron Akmal's name jumps out there. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. different times. Yeah, my God. <laughs> for, for a few reasons. Anyway, I, I don't know, but I reckon this show is about maybe even longer than two hours long, which must be our all-time record. Um, big apologies yes. to Dan, our, our video editor, who's had to <laughs> go through all of this. Um, and well done, listeners, for getting this far. And remember, uh, next Wednesday, 
if you if you're free you can go to the quiz phil's quiz um <laughs> the, the link will be in the description and there'll be a live show that you can sign up for uh, at some point next there's week there's even a picture around <laughs> there's even a picture around um cheers phil. and you and you win and... loads of tickets to the oval to see a t20 game that's the actual that's the there big we prize go. There and we loads go. of other prizes and thank you matt for not only joining us for for doing the research on 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 the on, the, on the question on, on jimmy anderson's woodworm globe exactly um and, and for sticking around <laughs> for the full two hours